It okay. will probably get progressively darker here because it does get dark early and we're at three o'clock. So we'll see. It'll get, get dark at three o'clock. Man, y'all are like on a different planet. It's weird. <laughs> weird. Okay. All right. It is like a different planet. We went out. There's so much snow here. It has snowed so much over the last couple of days. And we went out and uh, made a snowman this morning, like over on a skidoo trail. Mm. And we're going to go back and check on him tomorrow. I bet he'll be like completely buried. It's just That's wild. I was taking this little bumper guard off my new car earlier and I was sweating outside. So yeah. <laughs> different planets for sure. Different. Closer to the equator. Hey, what's up, bookworms? Mike back with another talk about nothing. And this week, my guest, even though I was, you know, two hours late to our meeting here, but hey, she's rolling with it. This is Sarah from Sarah's Read. What is up, my darling? How are you? Good, good. I'm having a great holiday. And thank you so much for having me on. I'm looking forward to this. This is my my version of quiet times. So. Yeah, right. Just getting to talk about some books and whatever's going on in life is always a lot more fun than talking about, hey, you know what I did on Halo? That's basically what I've been hearing. Hey, good dad, guess what I did on Halo? That's what I've been hearing for, you know, for like two days now. Or, hey, let me beat you at air hockey. You know, all these fun dad things or whatever. But, uh, yeah, let's get back to some normal things like some some books and see what other content creators are up to. So you had a good Christmas. That's that, that's good news. Everything go off as planned? Yes. Yeah. Everything went very smoothly, which is good. My husband usually gets gastro every Christmas and he has not. I will knock on something or he'll... He'll be over here to get me, but so far it's been good. Everybody's been doing well and it's just, you know, sugar overload, new things oh, yeah. overload. So there's a lot of highs and lows over the last couple of days, but overall. Yeah, I was trying to get good. back on uh, the healthy eating and it's just like, I opened my stocking for my wife and I'm like, you don't respect me respecting my body <laughs> at all, do you? Because uh, <laughs> I have one weakness in candy here is uh, Reese's peanut butter cups. And of course she had like, you know, three handfuls of it in there. And I was like, you don't. You don't like me skinny at all, do you? But, you know, there are worse problems to have. But, uh, you know, didn't have any big major, oh, God, I wish we could have got this done in time. We actually got everything done in time. We had to stay up till 2 a.m. in the morning uh, to get uh, every last present taken care of. But, uh, you know, we pulled it off, you know, got a little sick afterwards. But, hey, you know, these are just parent things. Right, guys? Good time. Right. And the good memories, you'll look back on it in 15 years and you'll just remember, you know, the kids and how they yeah, reacted. I so. hope I can remember that long away. You know, that's kind of where I'm at right now. Cause I can't <laughs> remember what true. I, I did yesterday. I forgot how old you are. Well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's one of those things that you get into your forties and you realize, you know, I can remember every word of the Humpty dance, but I can't remember what I did yesterday. You know, that's just, that's just kind of how it works, but uh, you'll get there soon enough, you know, but that's uh, true. Soon enjoy it while you can. Uh, so I want to talk about your channel a little bit. How did you decide that, uh, you know, Hey, I want to do this. I want to talk about books and just kind of start my own thing. Did you watch other people first? Did you have any help along the way? Really kind of just what really got you to this point? No, I definitely watched before starting the channel. So I think I, I talked about this probably with you once in the past, but I was studying for my licensing exam, which is a really stressful end of residency thing. So it kind of takes over your whole life. Like you're studying for this exam, you've built up for this over years. And uh, the way that I used to study was using this method where you would like set a, an amount of study time and then a break. So it prevents you from like procrastinating too much if you give yourself these little breaks. So the length of my break was like the perfect length for a booktube video. And so I really got into booktube and I would use that as a study break all the time. So I'd be like, okay, here's 45 minutes of studying and here's my 15 minute book video. And I really enjoyed that. So as soon as my test was over, I went on this like massive book buying spree. And I was like, this is my gift to myself and bought a ton of the fantasy books that people have been talking about that I really wanted to read and really got back into fantasy. And I was like, I would like to keep this up. Like I've been away for fan from fantasy for too long. And it just seemed like a lot of fun. I read a lot of classic fantasy and I saw people on booktube talking a lot about modern fantasy. And I was like, maybe I do have something that would be worthwhile to say. Cause that's always the fear, right? Is that you're putting your face out there and you're doing this and you're like, God, like who would even want to watch this? <laughs> Why are you doing this? But I thought that maybe I could, I could give a little bit of a different perspective and it's been really, really fun. Yeah, yeah, growing pretty, pretty well, uh, pretty reasonable rate, I think. There, it's, uh, it's already over three thousand, I think. No, I'm approaching three thousand, which uh -huh. is really exciting. 
that's great because first time we talked to you, you weren't even a thousand yet. So that's awesome. That's it's, it's incredible growth. So uh, yeah, I appreciate it. And you're always wearing a NASA shirt. Me being in Houston, I always appreciate the NASA <laughs> stuff. So uh, that, that's great. But uh, yeah, yeah, I think that there's a, what I enjoy about your channel is that you talk about some stuff that I probably will never read, you know, uh, and I, and I do appreciate that because I do like to learn about new things. I mean, Jay Kristoff's an author I thought I'd never read. And mm -hmm. I saw other people I know, other booktubers talking about it. And I decided to read it. Now I love it. And I'm going to read more of his stuff. So uh, yeah, I'm always, I know a lot of people are like, I only like to listen to stuff that I've already read or something like that. To me, I'm like, I'm always open to trying new things. I mean, for God's sakes, I read Lee Bardugo this past That's year. True. You know? That's so, true. I havenven't even read that. <laughs> she, she was talking before we started guys about reading a Sarah J Moss book. And it made me think, I well, I've read Lee Bardugo. I can get into this conversation. Right. So <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know if those two are anything alike. It just seems like fans of one usually like the other, you know. So I, I, I kind of, I kind of fall into that that trap a little bit. I, I like to watch other content creators talk about series I don't know anything about to see if, hey, you know, maybe I'll try that because uh, I, I respect a lot of you guys' opinions. And uh, sometimes I will find a hidden gem, like I did with a. I don't really want to call Empire of the Vampire a hidden gem, you know. I mean, you were talking about it. Pretty much everybody was talking about it except me, and so. Uh, I, I was glad that uh, I did go ahead and give it a chance because I, I really liked it. I know you, you enjoyed it, right? I did. I liked it. I didn't love it. It was my first of his books. So it was the first book mm -hmm. I had ever read by him. There were some parts that I really, really liked. I did find some of the timeline that was in the past yeah. to be like very dramatic, uh, but it worked for the character and it worked for the story. But as I got further along, I think like that back third was just, I just kept flipping. Like yeah. you needed to just keep going. And present timeline, Gabe really grew on me as I got to learn more about his life and what had happened. So I, I did really, I did end up really enjoying it. And I will definitely read the next one when it comes yeah, It kind of happened to me in a similar way. Where I was like, okay, I want more of the initiate school stuff, not this like weird jaded timeline. Then, uh, but then when we flip back, I was like, no, don't go back. I want to stay here now. So yeah, it kind of. <laughs> kind of grew on me anyway but i've always i've always been someone's kind of iffy on that format like i know everybody loves liza lock lamora and i was like i wish he would have just picked one you know either stay in this time or stay in that one because you're jumping back and forth too much so that's a that's a hard format to nail for me and i thought he did a pretty good job of it so yeah um, when you, you like find liza lock lamora? In both. i haven't read it yet oh, okay. so well, everybody loves it except me so you'll probably <laughs> what right. about name of the wind have you read name of the wind I have. I love the name of the one. I know you don't, but I, I do really love it. Everybody does. It's fine. That's why I call that. That's probably the only unpopular opinion that's actually an unpopular opinion I've done this channel. Because I think everything else I've done unpopular opinion on, other people have been like, yeah, I, I didn't like Catcher in the Rye either. But the yeah. uh, the name of the wind is about nine to one against me on that, that video. So, hey. And probably the people you are getting on the against, like the people who are with you, like it's probably time. I think some people have gotten really upset with the amount of time that has passed. Uh, and yeah. so it has yeah, they become jaded over time with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. For sure. Hey, I saw he talked about the, didn't he read the prologue of book three? Yeah. Is yeah. that like all he's written? <laughs> who knows? Apparently he has a chapter. He was going to read a chapter if he hit a certain stretch goal. So there must be, you know, there must be a chapter out there somewhere. But Did you listen to it? I, I didn't because I have tried to, I love them so much that I have really tried to separate myself from even thinking about them. <laughs> Cause yeah. I, I know once I get back into it, I'll really want the third one. And I see enough people who struggle with pressure and like what that can do to you mentally. And so I don't want to, I don't want to feel any resentment towards Patrick Rothfuss because I'm sure that if he was capable of writing the book that he would put in his best effort and it would happen. So I I don't want to, I don't want to be here like thinking like, Oh, like I'm so mad at this, this yeah. guy. So no, I just, I, I keep it away. That's where I got with the, with song of ice and fire. Cause you know, I was reading that long before there was a television series for it. So yeah, I, I've been in pain for 20 years now with that series, but I think I finally got over it. And just accepted it, you know, hey, it's not going to happen. You know what? It helped me discover a lot of new fantasy authors that I probably never would have gave a chance otherwise. Uh, so I, I look at it like that. But every time I talk about Song of Ice and Fire on the channel, I start getting really anxious about like, well, maybe, maybe, maybe it can actually happen, you know? So, yeah. Right? Uh, it doesn't tarnish how you feel about it. Like, I'm really glad I read both those series. Well, yeah. I've only read the first three of Song of, of Ice and Fire because I've heard that number four kind of starts a new, yeah, like a little does. bit of a new arc. Mm -hmm. So, but those three books are amazing like they're yeah. some of the best yeah i'll ever. say i never will say i regret i mean it's still one of my favorite fantasy series ever and it's not even mm -hmm. complete so it's that good so i'll never i'll never be upset about that but kind of what you're saying about uh you know just trying to think about it because you know yeah. 
keep There's, it. I got so much great stuff to read. How can I complain? You know, exactly. it would be nice to have this ending to the series that I love so much and feel like it could be like a little bit of redemption for what the television series did to it. But, you know, yeah, it's what it is. Have you read Will of Time yet? So I started the first book, Eye of That's the World. Funny. I started in September and I read a little bit in September and then it became October. And then there were people oh, kind of messaging like, oh, how's Wheel of Time going? And I try, I try really hard not to be negative. It was a struggle. I made it 350 pages in and I just couldn't do it anymore. Mm. I like the writing style was so not what I enjoy. I felt like for every sentence that I was getting that felt meaningful to me, I got like seven paragraphs to go with that. That did not feel meaningful to me. And I'm not a big world building person, um, which is like probably why I also don't enjoy Brandon Sanderson to the same degree that everybody else enjoys Brandon Sanderson. I can recognize why people really like Brandon Sanderson and the wheel of time, but it's just really hard for me to get through them. I, I, I tried, I probably will go back to eye of the world at some point, but it was just, it wasn't enjoyable. And then I was starting to feel angry about reading it. And I was like, Oh, I hate that book. Why am I going to pick it up? So I just put it, put it down and put it away and did not go back. What I try to tell people is uh, life's too short to read books you're not enjoying. And mm-hmm. uh, with Wheel of Time, I feel like if, if you aren't enjoying it by the end of book two, it's probably not a series for you. But uh, yeah, George's real good of taking seven paragraphs, what would take a normal author or a sentence to say. It's kind of his thing. So I definitely get that criticism. Uh, I, I, I actually do enjoy the books, but I, I, I'll have a ton of criticism for them. I, I really do. But um, wow, the first book, though. <laughs> I know. And I feel so bad. I don't want to be like, welcome to, you know, four minutes into this video when Sarah's ripping apart the, the wheel of time. I mean, Sanderson. But, well, now look, here's the thing with Sanderson is I thought Sanderson was like, and follow him. And I talked about how I thought he was just like amazing. Like he was going to be this generation's token. And then I read more of his stuff and now I'm kind of middle of the road on him. I think he has some, when he's really good, he's great. But a lot of his stuff has kind of fell flat for me in the second half. Like the second era of Mistborn was all oh, for me. Um, I think that Stormlight Archives lost its way. And I'm just like, uh, was Mistborn really as great as it was in my memory? Or is that just like nostalgia? You know, I, I'm really starting to think like that. So I'm starting to think, I really think he's more of a YA author than I originally thought that he was. And I'm not against YA. It's just not for me, you know, 43 year old man, not liking a lot of YA, it's going to happen. You know, sometimes I like some traditional fantasy. I like not everything to be so damn dark and dour all the time, mm-hmm. you know, but uh, the people that act like Brandon Sanderson could do no wrong. I think that's why, uh, that's why I lost a lot of, a lot of uh, subscribers. I think when I started saying that, when I did my full on read along and I started being like, Hmm, this guy ain't as, uh, you know, just this perfect being that I thought he was before I think, but uh, you know, Sanderson devotees, man, they're serious. They don't play around. People are really passionate. I think it's hard to hear criticism of the things that you're really mm-hmm. passionate about. Um, and the things that Sanderson does well, he does better than anybody, right? Mm-hmm. Like his magic systems are amazing. Yeah, his world building is excellent. His plotting is fantastic. Whenever I get to the end of one of his books, I'm really enjoying it. Like figuring out how all the pieces came together. He clearly has a vision for how he wants his books to fit together. But I just... I don't feel like his characters are particularly compelling. I don't like his prose, which I know a lot of people don't care about. So Mm -hmm. I think, I think that's why a lot of people find it. So find his writing so accessible. Um, But I agree. I have only read, so I read Warbreaker and I just finished the first two Mistborn books. So I have to read the third one, but that second Mistborn book, speaking of YA tropes, there were a lot of YA tropes in that book. And I was like, what is, what is happening? Why do people love this book so much? Yeah, that's why I said, I think it might be nostalgia for me just when I first discovered him. Cause I'd been out of reading fantasy for a while when I started reading uh, Mistborn. So yeah, yeah, I think that might've been one of those things i was just like i was just happy to be reading fantasy again and i'm trying not to do that thing where i feel like some people will talk themselves out of something that they actually liked i try not to do that too much but uh, i fear that if i revisited that i would be like dude this is like straight wish fulfillment ya stuff that i all the time complain about so i don't know i don't know uh <laughs> i'm kind of scared to revisit it honestly for that reason Keep it, keep it in your memory. But I, you, the, no one can take away his talents and he is prolific. Like he puts in the work, he mm. is invested in the books that he wants to read. He really cares about his fans. Like there's a lot of really great things about Brandon Sanderson. Oh, he's a genuinely great guy. And I love the way that he keeps his fans in the loop, you know, with his, he, yeah. he'll apologize for not updating his status bars on his website. <laughs> I'm like, who does that? You know, well, you got other authors 
I know when you just ask them for an update on a book and they're just like screaming obscenities at you, you know, but he's, he's, he's very, very transparent. And that's something that someone like I do, I like to share like the data of the channel and stuff with people just because I like to be transparent about why I'm making some of the decisions that I'm making. So that's something I really admire about Sanderson, but I do hope that Stormlight 5 gets back on course because I didn't like Stormlight 4 like at all. I'm waiting to hear. So I've I've listened. I haven't read any of Stormlight. So once I finish Mistborn, I think I'm going to take a pause before Era 2. And I'm going to start the first Stormlight book. And I have listened to a lot of people's opinions in a spoiler-free way on Rhythm of War. But my dad is just starting it. So he gets a little bit impatient. So he's like, I will wait until now to start number four. So then, you know, it won't be as long to wait for number five. So he, he just started it and I'm looking forward to seeing what he thinks about it. Um, because he liked Oathbreaker. Is it Oathbreaker is the third one? Uh, and Oathbringer. I think some people were Oathbringer. Oathbringer yeah. um, I think some people were mixed on that one and yeah. he ended up enjoying it. So I, I want to know how he feels about Rhythm of War. Hey, the first two were just like, just god tier they were just fantastic yeah. and then three kind of took like a change in direction so it was the first one that kind of got mixed but upon revisiting it before the fourth one came out i was like okay i like this a lot better than i remembered but four was just that was a struggle for me like really 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 a big struggle but i'm willing to give him a mulligan for the next one but the fact that he plans on doing this so slow i said he's doing two arcs two books of five mm -hmm. basically and i said i don't want to be waiting for this series until i'm like 80 so yes. I'm probably going to tap out after book five. Personally, that's that's me because that's going to be the end of the first arc. Plus, a lot of the characters he plans on focusing on the second one. I'm not crazy about so. Right. Never say never, but we will see. Now, you brought up this story about your dad when we talked about Stephen King. So I'll briefly kind of reiterate that uh, your dad was like me, very irresponsible in letting you read Stephen King at a young <laughs> age. And I think that's great. That's a great thing. I let my kid watch horror movies already. You know, I think it just depends on the kid, obviously. But uh, I just, I, I'm jealous. I think that's just an amazing relationship. But uh, do you guys traditionally agree on books or, because I know things that you guys differed on the Dark Tower ending, right? We so. don't all, we don't always agree. There are some books that I would definitely recommend to him and some that I would. And I tend, I have a pretty good handle on his reading taste. Like obviously tropey YA romance, I'm not going to give to yeah. him. <laughs> and he likes, um, certain things that I find really difficult. Like he really likes mystery elements books because he's a big mystery fan. He's huge Agatha Christie fan. He likes those pulpy detective novels, has not started Dresden. So I got him the first five Dresden books for oh, his birthday yeah. and I'm excited for him to start them because I know that he will love them. But he likes that more mystery element. He is not keen on horror. So I like, I do enjoy where fantasy and horror intersect. Um, Dark Tower is as far into horror as he will get. He... Other than that, for Stephen King, he's only read The Talisman, I think, and well, Black House as well. Yeah. So we we differ in a couple of venues, but we tend to have a lot of the same a lot of the same opinions. We both like classic fantasy. We both like that kind of sword and sorcery stuff. We both like historical fantasy. He's a big historical fiction writer. He's also a big King Arthur fan, which is where it came through to me. So he likes he likes those things. So Warlord Chronicles and Dresden are the two book series that I'm going to kind of throw at him next year this year i got him into john Gwynn. he's he's loving it yes. and that's going to be my plan for next year i'm planning on doing warlord chronicles in may i have it on the schedule the whole trilogy in may awesome. i have an opening there so uh, i love the authorian legend i've read a more to arthur a dozen times i was pretty much obsessed with it in high school mm -hmm. so uh, a lot of people said that they feel like he's done like the best new spin on the arthur legend so i'm excited to read because i i love the last kingdom on netflix but i've never read the saxon stories and i thought I want to read this author because when I talked to John Gwynn, he was the one that said, you know, that that was a big influence on him was Bernard Cornwell. So I was like, I want to check him out for that reason alone. But uh, but I was like, I don't want to start another 13 book series, you know, no. right now. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I was going to start with the Warlord Chronicle. Sounds like the, the best place to start. And you talked about those recently, didn't you? So good. They're so good. They're not only are they some of the best King Arthur, like some of the best retellings of that Arthurian legend there. It's one of the best trilogies that I have ever read. Wow, it is. Okay amazing and the book book one started off a little bit slowly for me because he uses all of the actual names place names um like there's no anglicizing of the names that people have so i found it a little bit difficult to remember who was who and which places were where initially right. because at least for me if i don't know how to pronounce something i have a harder time remembering it 
So for book two, I listened to the audiobook and then I got all of the names in my mind. And then for book three, I did like a combo of the audiobook and reading because I still prefer to read whenever mm-hmm. possible. And I read a lot <clears throat> faster than I listen. I can't do this like two or three times speed yeah. that other people seem to do because I can't I can't concentrate that when it's going that no. fast. But it was really helpful to uh, to know how to pronounce the the names. You know, when I watched The Last Kingdom, he will they will put on the, the screen whenever they go to like a new city, it'll show like the original translation of the name and then like the English version. So I was mm-hmm. wondering if that, that's something that they actually did from the books was putting the actual, you know, the real name, you know, not the like you put it, the uh, you know, the updated name on there. Right. So <laughs> that, that might be something. Yeah, that is a little a little jarring at first, but I, I'm excited to I'm always excited to check out a new author. They're so be either good. him I, or I, David. I, I truly think you'll love them. I really do. I don't see I mean, enough people that uh, I feel like we have, uh, you know, a lot of the same likes. I don't see any reason why I, I probably wouldn't. Uh, but yeah, he's reading John Gwynn. Which one is he reading? Is he reading The Shadow of the Gods or is he reading Faithful in the Fallen? He just finished Faithful, Faithful in the Fallen. So he's going to go on to the uh, follow-up Bone. trilogy now. Blood and okay, Bone. great. And he liked them? Yeah, he loved them. That sounds awesome. We should get a beer for yeah, sure. He is, he is uh, the um, best. He'd be, he'd be way more fun to talk, talk to like this than I am. So have you tried to get him to read any other Stephen King? I haven't. And I wonder like of the ones that I have read. So he, he has a particular difficulty with like anything that is violence towards kids, like any of that kind of stuff he finds really hard to read. So like, I think he would like a lot of things about it, but I also think there's some parts of it that he would struggle with. I wonder if he would like the stand. Um, He also was a very, he was brought up like very strict Catholic. And he always tells us what, because I tried to get him to read the stand and he was like, you don't understand Sarah. Like you don't understand what it was like to be five years old. And like, he was a bit of a mischievous kid. Like he acted out a fair bit when he was younger and he was like, I'd be sent to bed and told that like, I was going to hell when I died and like all these things are happening. And so now he's like, I'm not reading the stand where it's like the devil and God, like, I don't want to hear about that stuff. I'm like, Oh, you're older now. Are you getting worried about, <laughs> about where you're Well, wow, that's something. Yeah. No, I just, I hope that, I hope that one of my two kids gets an interest in reading so I can have that kind of relationship. Cause that sounds, that sounds like a blast. It really does to have that person, uh, you know, to talk to about those things and the, uh, be always honest with that's that, that that's the thing and uh you know that's a big thing with me is uh doing my wheel of time reviews right now of the show with with madison is getting a lot of people accusing us of not being genuine that i think yes, as a content sponsored, creator sponsored reviews <laughs> yeah as a content creator there is nothing that triggers me more than telling me that i'm not being honest with somebody because i was like I trashed one of the most popular books of this generation on the channel. And you think I'm not being honest, you know? So uh, I, I, I don't know. That's just something that really, really, really just bugs me is when someone says they're not, that you're not being honest. Is there anything, uh, you know, your channel is getting bigger now. Any, any, any kind of particular comments that really uh, get you uh, going a little bit? So I find, so some comments don't bother me at all. Like if someone is going to come on, I've had some comments where people come on, they're just like, you're like, am I allowed to curse here? Is that okay? Or (laughs) people will be like, you're a fucking idiot. And I'm like, all right, cool. And I'll just like, you know, whatever, I'll give it a a like and be like, sorry, you didn't like the video. Yeah. I'll say Um, thanks for watching. (laughs) If people say anything like demeaning towards any like other group of people or anything, it just gets a straight delete. I don't even pay attention to it. Um, so those kinds don't bother me. I've had a couple of people, um, comment on like books that I have on my shelf. So speaking of King Arthur, I have the book, um, Miss of Avalon on my shelf. Uh, and there's a yeah. lot of controversy around. I, 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 I got told about this when I mentioned it in a book hole, I had no idea. Right. I read it 25 years ago before like any of this came to light, yeah. like before anything happened, it was one of my favorite books, but now I feel like I can't really talk about it because there is a lot of stuff that kind of mires the book, which I'm fine with. I, there's tons of books that I can give an audience to that that's fine. But I did get like a couple of comments where people were like, you know, you've done this and you've said this and this has happened and you're a bad person. And I, I have to admit, I did take those kind of to heart. And I was like, Andrew, like, am I a bad person? He's like, Sarah, like, shut up, grow up. No, you're not a bad person. But like, those are the ones that are hard. Like people can come on, they can call me an idiot all they want to. Like, this is, these are my opinions. I do not even, I, I don't profess to be right about anything or everything ever. Um, and I've spent enough time in school to know how little I know about everything. 
but I, those are the ones that hurt. Like it's, it's hard when someone comes on and you're just trying to talk about books and they're like, you know what? You're shitty addition to the human race. So <laughs> yeah, you should read the comments on my, why you should read Harry Potter and uh, anything I do about HP Lovecraft. Go read those comments and see how. And it's goes. and it's hard, like, and that is a it's a difficult thing for people to talk about. And it's a difficult thing to have a really measured conversation about because you can acknowledge that things happen and that authors do things and say things and make decisions that are you know are harmful to certain people, but that doesn't erase the fact that you know twenty years of your life were devoted to a specific book or series, and that you have memories, and that it did you know do a lot of good for the world. So there's a a balance there, and sometimes it'd be really hard to have a balanced conversation on the internet. <laughs> yeah, someone calling me an idiot or ask me if I actually read the book or stuff. If I let that bother me, I would have quit this two years ago. You know? Totally. <laughs> I get that constantly. That's that's not, uh, especially like I said, there's the, the new, most of the comments I get, like I said, all the time, 99% to, to one is, is overly positive. I get people writing me messages, handwritten letters to my PO box about how much the channel means to them and stuff. So I, I focus on that, but these real time videos have just gotten us so much negative stuff and saying mean things about Madison too, where I was just like, all right, this shit's going to stop you guys. Cause I was like, this is not the kind of community that I've created here. So, uh, I mean, it's just, it's going to happen. You got your, you, you put yourself out there publicly. It's going to happen. And, you know, especially in this age where you can say anything you want without, you know, the threat of someone punching you in the face for it, you know? Yeah. So it, it, it's going to happen. You just kind of let it, let it roll. But yeah, the one with me is just saying that I'm lying because I want like, perks or something from amazon and like i said i've sold like 500 kindles for amazon and they wouldn't even send me a demo unit of the new one to review for them they don't care about my opinion you don't need it. <laughs> so uh and, and guys i i have a i have a nine to five i don't i don't i don't need any perks from amazon to send me to a season premiere of an episode or something that's not anything on my bucket list. I'm just here to talk about books and, of course, the show because I do enjoy the books. The books that Sarah didn't even finish book one of. So. Sorry. <laughs> but no, it's, it's I don't know, it's a very strange, it's a strange situation to be in. But I don't, that's the nice thing about the channel being a hobby is that you really can do and say what you want to say as long as you're not being mean to anybody. Sure. Like I I, I am not a big fan of like these tear down book rants. I know a lot of people really like them and that's great. Um, I will always be honest. I don't think I'll ever be mean, but mm -hmm. I will definitely be honest. And when, when this is for fun, you can be honest. Like you don't, you can read what you want. You can put out whatever videos you want. You can do whatever you want. Like if I put out something, I've done a couple of, if you like this book, you should watch this anime. Or like, if you like this anime, you should watch this book videos. Like a hundred people watch them, but the hundred people who watch them are really into both anime and fantasy. And I feel like they really like them. And that's fine because this is just for fun for me. So it really doesn't matter. Yeah, no, it's, that's what I think keeps it fun, really. Uh, and not not letting anybody bully you into talking about something you don't want to talk about. That's that's the big thing. So yeah, just, uh, you know, you sound like you got a thick skin already. So that's, that, that's, that's the best thing. Oh, you don't even because... want to know some of the things that people have said to me yeah. at the hospital. <laughs> oh, 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 I'm sure. I, I mean, you guys think it's bad on the internet. Imagine in real life when they're saying it's yes, your face. Yeah. I, I could not work in that field. That's for sure. But uh, so what about right now? What are you reading right now? Right now I am reading Turncoat. Changes oh, is next. And I'm super excited. It's like the one book that I've been, you know, working towards because everybody says that's you know, a, a big turning point in the series, but I hadn't even started the series yet. And people were like, just wait till you get the changes. I'm like, <laughs> oh, I'm okay. At 12 books. I'll let you know. You know, it's like, I haven't even started yet. You're telling me to wait for the 12th book. I mean, mm -hmm. I will say it was, uh, it, it meets the hype. Uh, that's all I'll say about it. But, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like with the Malazan thing where people are telling me, Oh, well, book six, book six, it gets really good. No, I think Dresden is pretty much good from the go. And it, it's one of those few series where, People will tell you it gets better as it goes along. And I was like, I'll be damned if they weren't right. It does keep getting better, which is amazing because yep. sequels rarely get better. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. like the it's like the Mission Impossible uh, of book series. And I felt like the, each one of those movies just kind of tops the one before. I felt like Dresden does a really great job of that. So uh, I'm excited for you to catch up. And then you got to wait like I do. I know I got to do the waiting game. But the Dresden is good in the way that like Buffy is good. So the first couple of books are like your, you know, baddie of the week. You've got your one mystery and it gets solved. 
And what makes it so good is like, as you make your way through the series, you see this underlying plot, you see what's coming together, the characters, how they all interconnect, how they're growing. And it's really rare to get a fantasy series where so much time passes along the course of the series. Like we've seen Harry from the time that he was in his early twenties up into his forties. That's a big chunk of time like that is a, an accomplishment yeah it's a heck of a character study it really mm-hmm. is and a lot of people just say that oh they're just you know like candy they're like, but they actually do have a lot of depth to them they really do i mean they're easy to read but i, I want people to understand when i say they're easy to read it doesn't mean that they're you, be a dummy i mean there's stuff you have to pay attention to there's lots of things to learn lots of character stuff but the the way he developed his characters is something i just i, I love i mean you think about like where Michael Carpenter was in book three and where he's at now, you know, it's like, wow, what a, what a growth for a character or a character like Butters, you know, that has just such a crazy arc over the course of the series. Or Molly, <laughs> I mean, it's just so many of them. you can think of like what they started like and what they are now. And yeah, what you said, when I first started, I was like, if someone has sold the, sold the series to me as it's like Buffy and angel, but with John Constantine as the lead. And I'm like, wow, okay, sure. I'll read that. Instead, somebody told me, oh, it's like Harry Potter for adults. I'm like, that's a terrible, terrible no. description for that series. <laughs> that is a terrible it's <laughs> But, you know, it, it, the whole time, I won't lie. I am reading it. I'm saying, you're a wizard, Harry. You know, I, I, just, <laughs> I, I do say that the whole time I'm reading it. But, yeah, it's, what, a, what a great series. I'm glad that I finally did. And see, if I had never started this channel, I would have probably never picked that series up. And that's the best thing about this not just getting other people to read but some of the stuff that i've learned about and picked up off recommendations and really have just become like a huge series for me and Dresden files is definitely one of them yeah definitely i i read um the first book stormfront years ago 15 years ago probably and i didn't ever read any of the other ones because i was like oh this is good but like i said i'm not a big mystery person so I picked it up because one of my good friends who also loves Buffy was like, you'll like this. This is like Buffy. And I was like, OK, cool. I will I will read it. But it was really heavily noir, which is not my go to genre. And I was like, yeah. you know what? I don't really love it. And then when I came to book two, people were like, no, no, it it grows, it changes. And it is my favorite decision that I have made since I started this channel was giving it a second chance. Yeah, it's a, it's high, it's high up there for me. Uh, so so you're a big Buffy fan, right? like big Buffy fan. Yeah. How many times do you think you've watched the series? So I watched it originally when it when it came on TV. And then I have probably watched it like, I don't know, all together, like all the way through. I've definitely watched it five or six times, but I have watched like individual episodes sure. countless times. Yeah, I think uh, over the year before they took it off Netflix, I would just every once I'll just pick some random season three episodes. Yeah. I love season three like to death. I have it like memorized. Three's so good, that's why. I'll just, I'll just watch like a random episode. There's an episode there like a uh, just like shoot. I want to say like last week and just I just put on. I think we had it on a Hulu, mm-hmm. and Hulu was about to expire that we had, and I was like, oh, I'm gonna watch this Buffy episode. And I watched that episode, The Wish. I love yep. that episode so much because I love those like what if alternate reality kind of episodes. Mm-hmm. So good. But yeah, I've watched Buffy so, so, so many times and it never gets older. And that's one of my instances of people saying like, how can you talk about HP Lovecraft when she was a terrible person? I mean, yeah, he wasn't that nice of a guy, but you know what? We're finding out a lot of stuff about Joss Whedon. What really a swell guy at all. I still nope. love Buffy the Vampire Slayer though. So I was like, I have this uncanny ability to separate art from authors and art from artists you know that's just i know not everybody can do that but but i can that's why i could talk about something like harry potter and still respect why you don't like it i get that but what i'm going to say is i'm always going to talk about the books on the channel and why i love the books and you know the 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 art the craft all that kind of stuff and i understand why some people were chased off you know because i do that but i'm just there's a billion booktube channels guys and all of them will do those things that you, you you want so if you want to just talk about the book that's what i'm here for so that's my focus if you think if you had a mission statement for what you want your channel to be what do you think it is i think what i would want it to be is for people who like to connect about characters. So I think that's definitely a big focus on my channel is that that that's my favorite part of reading. So the, the authors that I love is, you know, they're always going to be people who focus on character and also just for it to be a community where people can feel like it's okay to voice their opinions, to, you know, say what they have to say within the limits of, you know, being nice to everybody. And I have found like that, that has been the case so far. Um, I know everything is on a smaller scale. So like Discord's on a smaller scale, the channel's on a smaller scale, but it, it's the same thing. Like, I think it's a really good community that has built up who 
enjoy the, a lot of the same things who like the same things about books and who are pretty open about discussing my discord is still small enough that I haven't had to outright ban any like particular <laughs> topics of conversation. Yeah. Um, but my husband keeps a close eye on it. And I think if it ever did grow and you know, those, those, those things started to happen that he would be there to kind of nip it. It's amazing. I made a no politics rule on my discord and it's just the nicest, friendliest place on the internet. It's amazing <laughs> how that works. Right. Yeah, oh, well, it, it is what it is. But uh, yeah, so being a, a big Stephen King fan, uh, like like we are, yeah, characters matter first, right? I mean, that's mm -hmm. it. if you don't have characters I care about, I don't care about your world. So when you say you're not, I'm kind of on the same level where like world building is cool. It's not mandatory for me to like your series. And if you focus on that over your characters, I don't care how cool your world is. I don't care about the characters. I don't care about your books. So and I think that is just the King reader in me because – is there a better, better character writer out there that you've read? You know, so I mean, it's yeah, I'm going to make that comparison all the time. So when I get an author I love, like a Joe Abercrombie, like, why do you love Joe Abercrombie so much? I'm like, because he pays attention to his characters. You know, he really makes you give a shit about every character in one way or the other. You know, either you love them or you love to hate them, you know. So, uh, yeah, I think that's where uh, some of these uh, really, really popular fantasy books have just kind of lost me because it's like, yeah, their magic system's awesome. Yeah, the world is huge could care less about their characters and if your characters are just boring as watching grass grow you're not going to hold my attention what you're reading for no exactly i think that's the you get stephen king in there at a formative age and there's no turning back yeah so i'll i'll, I'll warn you about miss born era too man them, them characters are and it's too bad right because i love a western setting like that yeah. is that is something that i really enjoy and uh it's just, it's too bad. And I also have heard that Mistborn Era 2, I don't know if this is true or not, but I think Sanderson tries to lean into the humor and Sanderson's humor just does not do it. For it me. worked for me in the first book a little bit, this character Wayne, he, he has mm -hmm. some good one-liners, I think, but then like every book after that, it was like, oh, I'm not laughing with you anymore, Sanderson, I'm laughing <laughs> at you. I find it hard. And I think it's, it, I think it works well for a lot of people. And I think that Sanderson also has a very um, family friendly approach to fantasy. Like a lot of his like cursing or a lot of the words that he'll come up with, they're very family friendly, which I also really struggle with. Like I do, I do not have a problem with the colorful language and it comes off not feeling particularly adult. Not that I feel like you need to be, you know, swearing like a sailor for your book to feel adult, but Sometimes I'm just like, oh, I don't know. This is not. All right. Well, let me ask you a question. I want you to be completely honest. And maybe you're a deviant like me. Would you much <laughs> rather someone call a character a twat goblin like Jay Kristoff does? Or would you rather them say like storm it all? You know, I mean, personally, I'm going with I'm going with the Kristoff on this one. So, yeah, there's got to be like Chris, Kristoff's. It wasn't the profanity. It's just like the over the top nature. Some of it I was like, this is. This is also a little bit too much in the other direction, but I think, yes, I, I would prefer the uh, the standard standard cursing. Oh, it's just absurd. It was absurd language. <laughs> That's, it just made me love it so much, I think. But uh, I, I don't know. I Like I said, I didn't think that anybody could top Joe Abercrombie, just like the weird combinations of curse words. But man, he, he kind of blew him away a little bit there. But you like Joe, right? I love him. I think he's the funniest fantasy author who's writing right now. You know, it was it was kind of weird to me is when I said, yeah, when I think about it was it was a it was a blurb on the back of Trouble with Peace when I had the the reader advanced reader copy of that. It was one by Joe Hill who actually said, like, you know, it's twistingly funny or something like that. And I'm like, yeah, I think about first law and I think about humor. And then I was like, you know what? Actually, I find myself laughing a lot so much. in this series. And I think that was just kind of like that glass breaking moment where I realized he is very funny. <laughs> I never really thought about first law as funny before yeah. that moment. And that's weird that you can write about the content he writes about and make people laugh. Yeah. And I, I am very prickly when it comes to humor. My husband will say, I don't find anything funny. So he'll show me things. I'll be like, mm -hmm. and he wants like a much more visceral reaction out of me. But Joe Abercrombie legitimately cracks me up. I think he's so funny. So clever. I had a comment the other day that said, are you sure you like humor in books, Mike? Because you don't like this, you don't like this. And I was like, I like humor that's actually funny, like Douglas Adams, like Joe Abercrombie, you know, things like that. But, you know, it's weird to put Joe Abercrombie in the same sense with Douglas Adams. It's wild. Right? Because they're awesome. so they're so different, yeah. but both excellent. Well, they're both British. Where's that? Mm -hmm. That's true. Right? That's true. And when I talk to Joe, I mean, he's he's he's, he's hilarious. He's a, he's a barrel of laughs. So. It's so weird. You just wouldn't think a guy that's that that funny and just like, gosh darn it, huggable is going to be writing the content that he writes. It's, it's, it's amazing. So what's your favorite first law book? 
Got one? Well, I haven't read them all yet, so I've only read up as far as the heroes, and I know okay. this is where we're gonna go on opposite ends. But the heroes has been my favorite so far. I love it. A lot of people, a lot of people really, really dig the heroes. Me, that was my first military fantasy book, so mm-hmm. I was still. It's something I'm with with Malazan right now, getting used to a lot of just sitting around. Yes. waiting for battles that's something that's like i know that that's you know real it's just i don't think i want to read about but uh no heroes is one of those it's like over time i've thought about it and i like it more than i did upon my first read. that was back then is when i first started my channel is i would finish a book and immediately turn the camera on now yeah. i let you know a week or so go by to think about it so uh when i recorded my review for the heroes i was pretty rough on it i really was but uh, you know over time i've been like okay I love the second half of that book the first time I read it, but now I was like, I think that's something I revisited now, especially after Malazan and getting a little more of the military fan, a lot more of the military fantasy. I probably enjoy it even more this go around, but I don't think anything would save Red Country for me, but uh, you haven't got that far yet. So I haven't. And actually, after I finished Heroes, I immediately went to your Discord and I was like, this is amazing. Can't wait to see Mike's review. And then I watched it and I was like, God. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know if I would even go back and listen to that one now. Because like I said, that's when I was first getting started at this, but I, I don't know. Maybe I just... Best Served Cold was so good. And I think that I just wanted more of that. I wanted more Casca, you know, things like that. I just wanted more of that. So I was probably grading it in all the wrong reasons. Like I said, I've learned a lot since then, you know. <laughs> and also yeah. apologize to my fucking dice. <laughs> like the best yeah. life has ever been written. That shouldn't be that but... funny, but it is. I can't stop laughing at it. Yeah, it's so good. Yeah. And, and I think, uh, you know, we got this thing on my Discord because uh, we are at like, you know, 6,500 users or something like that. So you have people that pop in and pop out all the time and have this thing set up to when they leave, it says so-and-so lived happily ever after. And mm-hmm. it's become like this thing that whenever someone leaves to put like a gif or something, just making fun of that name or something in, in good hearted nature. It's nothing to be mean. Yep. But like someone left the other day something pink and I just said fucking pink. <laughs> like, whatever, call me. People were like, what are you talking about? I was like, ah, you got to read First Law. You think it was funny, you know? So yeah, yeah. So Joe Abercrombie, <laughs> funny guy. Funny. Never knew. <laughs> What about the original trilogy? Which is your favorite of those three? I think book two is probably my favorite of the original trilogy, um, but I like them all. I When I first picked it up, actually, it was one of the first modern fantasy books that I picked up when I came back into reading fantasy. And so I had myself all geared up to be like, okay, this is gonna be really different from the fantasy that you read when you were younger. And I picked it up, I read the first, I don't know, like 10 chapters or something. I was like, this actually feels a lot like classic fantasy. And there are a ton of tropes that get subverted along the way, which is, I guess, what gives it that modern flair. But it had enough of a base from what I loved about fantasy to pull me in right away. And then as I got to see some of those archetypes kind of flipped on their head and some of those tropes completely subverted, I was like, oh, yeah, he's really good. But I... It, I liked it instantly. And I like, a like I could read a slow story, you know, if, like you said, if you're used to reading Stephen King, you're okay taking some meandering paths to the end of the book. So I, I, I enjoyed them from the get-go. Yeah. I think what got me the first time I was like, oh, bias. So this is the Gandalf character. Oh, mm-hmm. oh, okay. And I think that also made me realize I appreciate a soft magic system. Yes. This is my preference as well, which is another like point against the, the Sanderson love for me. Right. This is good. I can't get accused of talking over you if you cough a lot. So make sure to make some of those pauses so that I I don't get that feedback. I almost hit mute just in time, guys. It was, it was close. It was close. But yeah, I, I have recovered, but uh, still got that that cough a little bit. So yeah. mm-hmm. thanks for covering for me on that one. No problem. No problem. <laughs> so uh, what are some other series that uh, I got to talk you into here? Have you read Red Rising? I have. Yes. I read Red Rising as it was released because I was reading a lot of YA at the time and Red Rising got marketed as a YA series. Don't ask me why. I guess because it's right. So strange, I guess, because of the dystopian angle of the first one and they are younger. It's kind of like a school type, you know, academy setting. So I could see how the first book could be marketed to people who like those things about YA. But the level of violence is just, you know, otherworldly. And as you continue on, it deviates from that wildly. Um, But I read it as it was published and loved it. I have to admit that, so one of my unpopular opinions that is truly unpopular is that I don't like Dark Age that much. Mm. I think it, for me, it, the pacing was 
very strange because there were parts of that book where I was so into it. And I was like, this is some of the best writing that Pierce Brown has done. And I need to keep flipping. And then there'd be hundreds of pages where I was like, God, I don't care. I don't want to see this character. I don't want this. So it felt like this kind of like roller coaster, like the whole time. But I think like the best parts of Dark Age are the best parts of Red Rising. But as a whole, I struggled a little bit with like the length and the pacing and some of the stuff that happened. I don't have a problem with with Grimdark, but some of it, it just seemed like this is totally over the top for the sake of as you know, being as grim as possible. Like there were characters who did things where I was like, I already knew that they were horrible. I already knew that they were capable of really bad things. I didn't need this to be the example that you gave, but you know, it, it, it's a very realistic depiction of a system that is in the kind of turmoil that they're in. And I am so attached to the characters. The end of that book, I need the next one. Like it's yeah. very painful to have to wait for the last one. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you saw that he had actually said he threw like 200 manuscript pages away because he wasn't satisfied with his own ending. And I'm like, look, take your time, do it right. But shit, I need it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dark Age, I found, was very divisive. And here was my theory at the time was I felt like people who grew up with the Hunger Games, Mm -hmm. I felt like this was the next step for them was to read this series because it kind of starts where it's welcoming for those people and then it just gets darker and darker and darker and darker and to the point where I think Dark Age is probably the closest thing to Joe Abercrombie I've read, besides oh, not written by Joe Abercrombie. It really felt like the sci-fi version of that world. It really did. So I, I understood why Dark Age was divisive on people, but I, I was my theory was that, okay, well, these are people who grew up on YA and they're having a hard time swallowing this. That was my theory at the time. But as I've thought about it, there are some characters and some storylines in Dark Age. I'm like, Probably could have been cut down mm-hmm. just a little bit, but a lot of people don't like Iron Gold either. And I think Iron Gold is incredible. So I, I, I really I liked know. Iron Gold. I did. I really, I really enjoyed Iron Gold. But I, I will say at the end of Dark Age, I was like, holy shit, I think just about every any any character right now could die. And I wouldn't be shocked. Any character, even the main ones, could die yeah. right now, and I would not be stunned. And, and uh, there's the, someone that I really attached to. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a part where I won't say the character's name. But there's a character like walking around with a spear stuck through them. I'm like, they're going to be okay, right? <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, I was like, oh, shit, he might actually do this. So uh, me and a, a good friend, the one who got me into this series, where we were talking about it the other night well, before we watched the, the Wheel of Time finale. And uh, we were basically talking about this, saying like, there's no way that character makes it through this series alive. I'm like, oh, no, no way, no way. There's no way that Pierce will do that. So. I don't know. I don't know. I'm anxious to, to see. I'm glad because it seems like most people I know have read the trilogy, but they're like, I'm not going to read four and five until six, you know, comes out. So I can just watch, you know, read them. My wife even has done that. She's only read the original trilogy, but yeah, the fact that you read them before, you actually read before me then. So I didn't read them all until, you know, 2019. And I think this is part of, so you hear people talk about a lot on booktube and just online, like, oh, I read things and then I forget, like, I don't remember anything that happened during that series. And I think part of that is that binge culture, like swallowing things so quickly. Like I remember so much more about Red Rising because I read them as they came out yearly. And then I you know, got to think about them. And then I reintroduced and it kind of solidifies those long-term memories instead of those short-term memories. But you read a series in a weekend, which I have done with other series, um, and, and you just don't form those same kinds of memories. So it's hard to feel that same emotional connection. And it's hard to recall the details in the same way. And this is my problem with audiobook listeners. I get this reputation as someone who hates audiobook listeners. And I definitely do not. Most of the people on my discord are audio only people, you know, that mm-hmm. that's fine. Whatever way you consume the, if, if that's what works for you, do that do that. But I will say the people who just crank these things up to three speed to get through them. Yeah. You're not going to remember anything. You're, in, you're, you're, you're getting this too fast, you know? So, I mean, everyone's different. That might not be the case with everyone. I get that. But the people that I find, especially like you see these book tubers are like, I read 147 books this month. I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's a thing because their audio is audio booking that speed. And then like a month later, someone would ask them about that book. And I'm like, oh, I don't really remember much about it. I wonder why you can't listen to something that fast and retain anything, you know? No. So no. yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you. I can, I read fast. I mean, that's not a secret that I read fast, but I only read, I don't audio books. I think that's why I, people all the time. Wow. How can you remember that? I don't know. You just, I read it. I don't know what to say. I don't remember everything. 
you know, there's stuff going through some of these Malazan books now. I'm like, yeah, I can't say I remember that because they're just freaking big and they're complex as hell, you know, but I also get the, how do you read so many different series at one time? To me, that's not like any different than watching TV. How do you watch several TV shows at one time? This is what I said. My mom asked me this question the other day. She's like, how are you reading all those books at once? I was like, think about how many shows you're in the middle yeah. of, mom. Like, just, you know. I don't find it any different. I no. don't know. It's, I, maybe that's just me. But I, I think the only thing with that is I got to stop. And I did mostly, for the most part, stopped starting different multiple series at one, one time because I got to the point where I think I started I started Witcher, Red Rising, Lightbringer, Demon Cycle, all these like at the same time. Mm-hmm. And I've only finished one of those, you know, and it was Red Rising because it was like it's just it's too much doing all these series. So I got this new plan going forward where I'm just OK, I'm going to start a series. I'm going to finish that series before I move on to the next series kind of thing. So we're starting with Tad Williams, but I'm also going to be doing uh, what the Nevernight Chronicle by Jay Kristoff kind of at the same time because that's for a read along. So okay. I was like, okay, I'm starting multiple series here, but I have like a plan to finish those before I start like a third series. But, you know, these things sometimes go off the rails, you know, you get Together, my, husband did, um, and my husband did buy me the Nevernight books for Christmas. So I will, uh, I'll read those soon too. Okay. Um, did you ask me, do I do a lot of read-alongs? Yeah. Are you started, have you gotten bit by the read-along bug yet? Cause <laughs> there's a lot, I, I had to just basically end a few uh, recently because I overexerted myself. Like I, literally every month i'm looking at my team i'm like okay i've got three of the four things i plan to read this month are, are scheduled you know and i'm like that's not giving me any room to have like the comfort read of something of oh this just came out i'd like to read that and i felt like i was just over exhorting myself so have you gotten bit by that bug yet of committee to too many read alongs <laughs> december i definitely did and then i felt that pressure and i love because my birthday is right before christmas so i always get a ton of books at this time of year and i like just picking the one that i want to read the most and reading it and i didn't feel like i could do that this year so i was like this is actually great because now i can show myself that this is not feasible and this is not what i should do so i'm going to do one read along on the discord like on the channel per month that you know if people want to join in then that's great and other than that, I will commit to reading certain books with like friends if they're going to read it and it's something that's on the TBR, but I, I don't think I'll go over like three or four. I don't even know if I'm going to go up to three or four because I just want to have flexibility to read what I want to read. And life is busy. Like I spend every month I have like between six and eight 24 hour shifts at the hospital then like with the kids and all their activities and actually reading the books and recording the videos, like there's not a lot of time. <laughs> There's got to be yeah. some flexibility there. So it's uh, it was too much. I think I had like six or seven in December that I was reading with other people. I was like, this is not sustainable. <laughs> yeah, I'd say I always want to keep this fun. And I was getting to the point where I was like, this is not going to be fun if I keep forcing myself to follow this schedule because I overcommit like a moron. So uh, I'm glad there's a lot of people on the Discord who they arrange read-alongs and they do them completely without me. I love that. I, I love encouraging that. So there's people doing like war and peace right now. I'm like, like, I think it's awesome. You guys are doing that, but I'll probably never read it because I just, I don't have that much patience to read that. Uh, I might read Shogun. I don't know. What's, what's like the longest book you have that you, you wonder if you'll ever get to reading it. Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell is up there by Susanna Clark. So is I that really had... long. Cause I said that was one of the ones I was interested in as a standalone, but is that like stupid long? Cause I have it on digital. <laughs> Yeah, oh, giant. I didn't know. Jeez. Okay. Yeah, And there are footnotes. I think like it's long and dense, I think. So that is one of the longer ones that I have that I have not read before. Um, it's probably the longest unread book that I have. I mean, I'm reading the um, live ship traders right now by Robin Hobb. Those are all pretty chunky, but I find her writing really easy to get into. Like, I don't, okay. it's well, not... Hey, I want to talk about Robin Hobb. I got to pick okay. up brain a little bit. Did you just start reading her this year? Uh, so no, I read first year, the year before last, and then okay, so, but you're recent, you're break. recent to Robin yes, Hobb. recently. Yeah. Yeah. So as someone who loved Assassin's Apprentice, loved Royal Assassin, could not stand Assassin's Quest. <laughs> well, I like live ship traders. So for me, I put off live ship traders for so long because I loved Fitz so much. And I think Ship of Magic, the first book, is it's one of my favorite books that I've read this year. It's really? amazing. And if you love characters and especially antagonists, like complex antagonists, then I think you would love it. You might find, so I didn't find Assassin's Quest to be slow, but I know that that is a, a common, like you are not the only person who was like, okay, this is a very long journey from 
from here to there. So I think some people do say that that first like 150 to 200 pages of Ship of Magic is slow, but it might be the kind of slow that you enjoy because to me, it feels like the same kind of like slow that I get in a Stephen King novel. Like it's very much family interpersonal conflict that is playing out. So you follow this um, trader family and it's all of their family drama essentially, but it's really fascinating. I don't even like boats. I don't, I don't like any, I, we share this. I don't like the ocean. Yeah. I don't like any of the things that are down there. I don't want to be on it, but I, th- this book was amazing in terms of antagonists who are actually like, think about Regal who she wrote in the first trilogy, like the opposite of that. The, the multi POV really works for her villains because she's great at making you understand characters. And so, whereas with the first year, we only got into Fitz's head. We now get inside everybody's head and that makes a big difference. So she gives you point of view from the villains. She does. Yeah. And it's that's great. In, that's intriguing. See, no one <laughs> told me that yet. And I try to get across people. It's like, it's like, I think that she did develop her characters. Great. I thought that, they made some decisions in that third book that I thought were really, really out there. As much as like a character like a Regal, like I couldn't stand and want to punch him in the face. A very mustache twirling bad guy that was evil for the sake of being evil, I thought. So, yeah, I think I would really like to hear that from, uh, from the the, uh, the other point of view. And, yeah, I'm not crazy. It's not just because of the fear of the ocean. It's books I find where you're just on the water just bore the hell out of me. Because if you don't love that crew that's mm-hmm. on that boat, you're stuck with them. For quite a yeah. while, anybody else jumping out of the ocean to, to be introduced, you know. So uh, it's kind of been a strike. I think that's just that's just my PTSD from Moby Dick. I read Moby Dick <laughs> in high school, and I just oh, I wanted to kill myself. <laughs> that and Old Man the Sea, both of those, just like oh my god, I hate the ocean. <laughs> you know? I do love Hemingway, so I am I am partial to Old Man in the Sea, but. Yes, I agree. It's, that was uh, that was one of my hardest things to put in that unpopular opinion to admit because I think he's an incredible writer. Just that mm-hmm. one story just never really got with me at, at, at all. Hey, let's talk about some classics. That's some good sure. stuff. Yep. I refused to talk about classics on the channel for a while because we were in that time where we were tr- apparently they were trying to get everything that was written before like 19... 19- 90 like ripped off shelves and i was like that's just like a lightning rod for controversy right because like full disclosure i love gone with the wind i think it's an incredible book it's, it really it really is i understand why some people don't like it i definitely understand it uh but you know uh, i also am one of those who thinks hey those who don't pay attention to history are doomed to repeat it so i'm like let's not just tear everything down and pretend it never existed so i refused to kind of talk about class for a while then i said screw it one day and i said i'm just going to talk about these classic books i love and it's a video that's been very well received, you know, very, very well received. I I, I told uh, Philip about this. A professor from Rutgers actually emailed me and said he had some, he had like five books off that list on his reading list. And so he showed that video in his class with students. They were all excited to watch some of those books that I talked about. That, that's the coolest thing in the world, awesome. honestly, to hear that. That was amazing. So it made me realize, hey, classics don't have to suck, you guys. You know, I know that they're <laughs> assigned to you, so you feel like you're being forced to read them. But I love some classic literature. So what are some of your favorite classic books? A, a new favorite is East of Eden by John Steinbeck. I read that this year. One of my new favorite, I guess it's a modern classic, but one of my new favorites, I love John Steinbeck in general. I, all of the things I have read by him, I have really loved. Um, I love Hemingway. Um, the Sun Also Rises is one of my favorite books ever. And it is my favorite that I have read so far by him. Older classics, I really love Frankenstein. So that's one sure. that is dear to my heart. I How like amazing is it that book's 200 years old and still talked about frequently. That's incredible, right? isn't it? What a legacy. Yeah, it is. It is wild that it has held up. It has held up so well and it still resonates. So if you read it now, there's yeah. still things that you can see in there that will be meaningful to life. Mm-hmm. So no, that's that's great. I like Wuthering Heights. I like Jane Eyre. Those are kind of like the gothic fiction type ones that I like. It's interesting because Wuthering Heights is a book that I read when I was a young teenager, um, 16 or 17, let's say. And I hated it. I was like, this is the worst. Why would anybody like this book? And then I went back and read it later, like in my mid twenties, I was like, Oh, I, I was just totally reading this from the wrong angle and the wrong perspective. And so it's interesting how you can go back and read things at a different time in your life and feel completely differently about them. And that was I like that book. I, I think of my memory, it has been some years, but it almost had like a fringe horror elements to it that I didn't really expect in a book like Wuthering Heights, but yeah, yeah, I like it. I like it. Re- Rebecca is a great one. If you, have you read Rebecca? Mm-hmm. 
I think you would probably like it. That has some horror elements. It's like a psychological thriller kind of. And it was one that was on my list for a long time and I hadn't read it. And I finally read it this year and it was phenomenal. Daphne du Maurier's writing is really nice. And it's just a very compelling story. You kind of have this central mystery that you're trying to see what happened and discover what's up with this uh, manor home and what's happened there. And it all feels very creepy and atmospheric. It's really, really good. You have like any uh, classic, this is kind of a weird question. You have like any <laughs> classic that you love and like your spouse despises? Because me and my wife have argued about Lord of the Flies for years. <laughs> Are you pro or con? I'm for, I'm for, Are she's for. against. I'm like, you know, you know how many times that book has been ripped off? I mean, you can watch just about any Young adult TV show today, they're just riffing on Lord of the Flies. They're straight <laughs> on an island. They got to establish a, a hierarchy. You know, I say mm-hmm. it's, it's still today. I think the, the influence of that book is like untouchable. And she's like, it's garbage because she was forced to read it. Same with <laughs> yeah. the, in the in the Heart of Darkness. She can't stand it. And I love it. So I, I don't know. There's, there's something about classics. I think people were just have a they're totally for it or totally against it. So do you guys disagree on anything like that? Uh, there's no classic that we have disagreed on, but to be fair, Andrew hasn't read a lot of classics outside of what he had to read right. for school. It's just not his area, but there is an author that we really disagree on. So one, an author that I really love, her name is Margaret Atwood. She's a Canadian writer. She I just writes know. like literary fiction slash Canadian fiction, whatever you want to call it. One of her books called Orcs and Creek is one of my favorite books of all time. It is dystopian. And I know like I, I personally feel very burnt out on anything to do with, with dystopian fiction, but in my opinion, it is one of the best instances of dystopian fiction. And I just love her writing in general, but we had to read The Handmaid's Tale. We did a satire class together in university. So we met, Andrew and I met in organic chemistry. And then once we started dating, we used to take a lot of our electives together so that we could hang out at school. So we did a bunch of English electives together. We both did English minors. So we took this satire class together and we had to read The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. And I was like, this is amazing. This is groundbreaking. He's like, this is trash. Like he didn't even finish it. And then he expected me to tell him what happened at the end. So he could write essays for it when he had to do like his final exam or whatever. And I was like, I shouldn't even tell you, like I, right. I should just make you fail. But no, he absolutely hates her writing. Did you, did you watch the TV show? Uh, Handmaid's Tale? I didn't, but I heard good things about it. Here's the thing about it. I was like, first season was fantastic. We loved it. Second season was awful. And third was so bad we quit. And everyone was like, yeah, because the first season covered the book. And that's all there is. I was like, oh, okay. So they ran out of source material. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, it's, it's really good. It's very well acted. I think the cast is just stellar. It, re- it really is. I think it's kind of what made Hulu like legitimize them actually a little bit was that show. Was having this. So yeah, I'd recommend it. I haven't read the book, but I've heard a lot of people say, yeah, it is very, very faithful to the book. It's a... Uh, uh, very very uh dark content which you know i'm always like i i'm burnt out as well on this dystopian thing who isn't i think at this point but i every once in a while i will go back and be like oh yeah that's why i liked it in the first place you know so just like uh, a lot of talk about the gonna be reading uh tab williams here and i said a lot of people saying oh it's got a lot of those traditional fancy tropes and i'm like Every once in a while, though, I like that. I like to remember why I fell in love with this genre in the first place. So when I go back to something like that or I read you know, Stephen King, Long Walk for the first time a couple of years ago. And I was like, oh, my God, this guy was doing dystopia before everybody else. And I had no idea. You know, he, you know, he wrote The Long Walk when he was like 17. It's wild. The things that he has done and when he accomplished them, I, I have no time for anybody telling me that Stephen King is not talented. Yeah, I, I made the joke about her being like Jack and The Shining, like flipping tables and stuff when uh, when someone says that Stephen King is schlock. Mm-hmm. And I, I, we've already talked about King. I don't, I don't want to go down that road again, but yeah, that's just that's just ridiculous. I mean, he's one of the best selling authors of our generation. And it still drives me crazy that Dean Koontz has sold more. Right. <laughs> <laughs> probably Nora Roberts has too. So I mean, well, I mean, there's some really great bands that have been outsold by Nickelback, but Hey, you're from Canada. So I can't say that. Can I? So, so you could say it. This is, this is one How of do my you guys feel about Nickelback in Canada? <laughs> Pardon? How do you guys feel about Nickelback in Canada? Uh, well, everyone that I know does not like them. I'm the, the person that I know the best is my husband. He despises them. I do ask sometimes I'm like, Andrew, all of these like late nineties bands, they all sound the same. Like you could play five songs 
for me. And I honestly probably couldn't tell you which one is Nickelback versus one of those other bands. What makes them so much worse? He's like, you just, you just don't understand Sarah. This just, they just are. I'm like, okay. Yeah, They were kind of like the poster child for that. So they kind of took a, I feel like they took a little uh, unnecessary criticism. Whereas I feel like a band like Rush didn't get enough recognition because they're amazing. They're amazing. So there, there's my, there's my contribution to there's your plug if we're going to talk about music i will tell you the only place where we intersect probably is the beatles (laughs) Uh, i like shania twain does that count my mom loves shania twain so so that's a canadian staple they would be going into Canadian music today. There we go. She saw her in concert. Had and Terrence and Philip. I love Terrence and Philip. Wait, they aren't actually from Canada, are they? <laughs> Who else is it, like in the Canadian music scene? I don't know. I really don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, I've learned a lot about Canadian and Australian authors over the last couple of years. So it's mm-hmm. a it's been it's been a wild ride. I, I think Stephen Erickson's Canadian. I'm gonna be talking yeah. to him very soon. So that should that should be something. So. Uh, what about you? What about you? you? Got any any questions for me or anything? I don't know. Yeah, let's talk about. So let's talk a little bit about the Beatles because the the show just came out or the documentary just Get came back. out. Now, full disclosure, I have only watched part one because I watched part one, and then my dad was like, "Sarah, the Beatles documentary is out." I was like, "I know." I watched part one. He was like, "What?" without me yeah he was insulted huh yeah i'm sorry so he's out of town until this week and we're gonna watch parts two and three when he when he comes back um but i am interested in like what your what are your favorite albums favorite songs those kinds of things oh shoot the beatles oh man it's like asking me to pick a favorite kid uh (laughs) i always go with the white album just because i feel like it influenced just about every damn kind of music you can think of it has folk has r&b it has rock has hard rock it has country it's just incredible what they did in that album and it's so wild to think back and that was a time when they were really in turmoil you know that they put together a double album that was that good but uh that i couldn't pick a favorite song because it would change tomorrow it, it really would but watch that documentary was just so wonderful because i felt like it dispelled a lot of the myths about how bad of a place they were in at the time it was just like they had families they were growing apart because that's what people do when they get in their late. It's wild to think that they were all under 30 at that point, too. That they had taken over the world, basically, uh, before the age of 30. And that's a and big that thing, just, too, right? You start off this band with your friends because you mm-hmm. love music. You want to push something new. You want to push the boundaries. And you become a sensation. That's a hard transition to make. Yeah, and I got to think, guys, think back to your your group of your, your high school buddies. It's mm-hmm. like eventually you all had high – you all got – married had kids and stuff and it did just because you were going in different directions didn't mean you love your friends any less it's just like you have to prioritize your family you know uh johnny yoko were in love no matter how you felt about it you know and paul and linda were in love and they were going to go do their own things too so it just it, to me it was a natural tr- progression but it, it, there are a lot of things about it just show they were still all really I mean, sure they were, they were fighting families fight you know but we'd always believe that like george just said fuck you and threw a table and walked out and stuff and it was never like that at all you know yeah. so it was he left the band for five days guys you know and it's just yoko just sat there and looked at magazines and crocheted the whole time she didn't do anything you know so it's just i feel like it's just been something that's been kept a secret for 50 years you know and i gotta thank peter jackson for for doing that I can't wait to to finish it. It's so good. It's, uh, and it's hard to, because obviously you had the tragedy that befell them afterward because they had a lot of music making years left and then they were unable to come back together. Like, we don't know what could have happened or what would have happened, what kind of collaborations or changes there would have been because unfortunately they weren't afforded that opportunity. Yeah, I think uh, there's a part in there where George Harrison is talking about he has so much songs to do, so he's thinking about doing a solo album because if he only put like one or two on each Beatles record, he would be doing this for you know forever. And John said he thought that was a great idea. And Paul McCartney in a recent interview said if he, if he felt like if he had been told that at the time, the band probably would have been saved. If they would just done like Kiss, went out and had their solo albums, and then come back and make an album together, the band probably would have been saved. So that's just like kind of the dagger about it, really. But great bands break up, you know. I mean, it just. They and the ones that don't probably should. <laughs> After a while, you know, it's just it's just kind of the way it is. That's just too much talent for one band. Yeah, and you don't want to stagnate. And they were doing so much stuff that was boundary pushing that the last thing I'm sure they wanted to do was stagnate and to to keep doing the same thing. So having that breathing room would have been really helpful. But when you're the first group that kind of hits that mega stardom, you don't really have a lot to fall back on. You don't have a lot of people to look back on and and take advice from 
And I look at it like this. I love a lot of their solo stuff. And I feel like, well, you know, hey, we never would have got that. But I'm like, think about all the awesome Beatles stuff. We got. Yeah. You know, so yeah, yeah, it's one of those things. But I'm a real big, it's better to burn out than fade away type. You know, they went yeah. out on top. That's the way I like to look at it. Why does everybody hold Breaking Bad so high? Because it quit when it was on top. You yeah. know, if it went three more seasons, it probably would have gotten watered down and not been as good kind of thing. So I try, at least these are the things I tell myself to, to, <laughs> to be okay with a band that broke up before I was born, you know? And this is something, so I know that you do not watch this medium, but this is something that I really enjoy about anime is that that non-Western, like it's a very Western idea that we need to milk everything for every possible penny that we can get out of it. Like we need to make this a 14 series season show we need to get do all the merchandise and get everything that we possibly can out of it some of the best anime that i like are ones that lasted for a single season and that's it there was one arc they had one story they went in they told it it ended it was perfect and that's something that we do not do enough here yeah yeah i think a lot of things get a little a little too long in the tooth Mm -hmm. for sure here but i'm not against anime i just i've never watched one that really i just i have a problem with animation I just yeah. don't watch animation that much. I mean, I love that Castlevania show. I was going to say, I, you liked Castlevania, right? My husband I just, also. I watch it. one or two episodes and then I don't watch another one for months. You yeah. know, it's just, that's just kind of how it goes. But uh, it's just, it's just one of those sayings. But the funny story about that is my kid, we were at the Books a Million, little bookstore we have in the mall out here. And we were looking at the manga, which by the way, American comments, American comics, one Tylo Bay manga, rose and rose and rose and rose and rose and rose. But keep telling me, that American comics, that there's nothing wrong, guys. Yeah, keep telling me that. Anyhow, so I got really into that. I mean, I've always still only read, you know, three things. Junji Ito, I've read that. Uh, Berserk, I'm still doing. And uh, Death Note. And yeah. I'm planning on starting Vinland Saga in, in January. So I'm, I'm excited about getting in more into that because I miss comics. And I yeah. felt like American comics have just went down the toilet in the last decade. And it seems like Eastern comics are still very much about the comics. So I'm excited about that. But with the anime thing is what's funny is we were at the store and he saw, I saw Attack on Titan. I was like, hey, hey, I want to read this. And he's like, oh, I've been watching the anime. I'm like, what? You've been watching what? And uh, he's like, oh, yeah, I finished it. And, and the thing was, is like, people were like, well, did you get mad? You know, then you found out that he'd been watching it. I was like, no, I just didn't want to tell me the ending. <laughs> Because <laughs> I haven't read it yet. Well, there's but, still uh, there's still half of a season left, so we can't he can't tell you the yeah, full end. Yeah, I, I didn't realize that, but 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 yeah, um, I I have since then been like, oh, there's a lot to see. I'm just nudity, violence, no big deal. You know, he's a big kid, right? So that's me <laughs> trying to be the best parent that I can be. Act like there's nothing wrong with it. That normalizes it, you know. So, uh, but yeah, I was more worried he was going to tell me what happens, you know. It is scary. I, I, I mean, I'm probably more scared of things than your son, to be fair. He's probably braver than I am, but it took me a long time to finally buckle down and watch attack on Titan because one of my biggest, like the one of the things I'm most scared of is cannibals. Um, not that attack on Titan is cannibals, but the Titans do eat people yeah, like they, sure. that is, that is part of it. And it is one of the things that I am most terrified of because of a mishap with America's most wanted when I was a little kid and uh, it uh, took me a really long time to get into it, but I really love it. I think if you were going to like an anime, you probably would like that because it doesn't have a lot of those common jokes and expression. <laughs> and things, yeah, like it doesn't it doesn't have any of that. It is very grim and the characters are great. But if it's animation in general, I mean, it's you like what you like. It's just hard for me to I don't know. I just I'll watch like an episode or two and then I find myself scrolling my phone, not even paying attention anymore. I don't know. It just doesn't hold my interest that much. I have no idea why. Cause I mean, I grew up watching like He-Man and Transformers and stuff. I should be all over this, right? I don't know. Just never really, never really sticks with me. So it's 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 I'm obviously much more accepting of giving it a shot now than mm-hmm. I was even six months ago before I read Berserk, you yeah. know. So I'm always willing to try new things, guys. I'm not closed off. I'm not, I'm a never say never guy. I really am. Well, here we go. This is not an anime, but I'm sure because everyone was talking about it like a month ago. Arcane just came out, which was the League of Legends I've show. Heard. I know everybody has heard of it. Everyone, everyone I was talking to Jay Kristoff, even he recommended it. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you should, then we can talk about it. It has excellent characters, fantastic antagonist. Is It, it makes is such it, a good discussion. Is it R-rated? Yes. Oh, okay. So I say maybe I can watch it with my kid, but no, that sounds like because we watched Dragon Prince together. Although if you watched Attack on Titan, he's yeah. probably good to go. <laughs> well, here's the thing. I feel like me and him, we keep that on the DL. When mom yeah. finds out, it's like you did what? Yeah. 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 yeah so when she found out that uh, while she was gone, we watched uh, we watched her Friday the 13th movie. And she was like, What? I was like, 
<laughs> I was watching those at six. I'm fine, I think. You know, so uh, he watched it. I mean, you were here when he watched it. So I, I don't know what to tell you, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh it depends on the kid, right? We watch so sorry to bring this back to Buffy again, but I watched that with my dad as it was was coming out. So like season one came out in 1997. So 1997, I would have been nine. Oh boy. So that's when <laughs> I was I, older. I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's 10 years. I just turned 33. There's 10 years between yeah. us, right? Yeah. So I, when I was watching it, and I, I, won't, I will not lie, guys. I like the movie was okay. The Buffy Vampire Slayer movie was okay. I, I, I watched it, whatever. The first season of the show, I saw the billboard of Sarah Michelle Gellar, and I was like, holy moly, I'm watching that. <laughs> so, yeah. And then I was watching, like, wow, this is actually a really good show, though. So, yeah. yeah. I stuck with we it. just happened upon it. I think we happened upon the first episode my dad and I watched. We watched the, it's the Praying Mantis episode in yeah. season one. And we were like, what is this? And then we tuned in every week and we watched it from, from then on. So that was, so I have a really sad story. So this is going to be like a bad daughter story. My dad and I watched Buffy every day of our lives, every Monday night, whenever it came. I think Buffy was Monday and Angel was Tuesday, maybe. And during season seven, I got my first boyfriend and I abandoned the Buffy hour to talk to him on the phone. And at the time, like, I could not understand why he was upset about that. And now when I look back, I'm like, that is the biggest mistake I've ever made. Right. Like, how could I do that? That's heartbreaking. <laughs> and I feel so bad for it now. But at the time, you know, you're like. Whatever. Why I thought Buffy was a different show is because it didn't matter. Guys liked it just as much as gals did. It, it kind of got that reputation of being like a gal show. I was like, why? Because it had a female lead. I was like, it has great male characters on it it really did it it, it did wrote them great you know i mean today there's still people who argue buff uh, or, um, sorry angel or spike i think those people are insane it's angel but anyhow <laughs> but uh but i thought that was really great and i think back to uh me and my roommate at the time a guy we were watching the episode the body and we're both just sobbing watching this two guys watching a show just sobbing over this you know so that's why that was such a different show for me. It was just, I don't think it'll ever be replicated. Yeah. If you well. take out the body and you take out Hush, because I feel like when you talk about Buffy, you need to take out those two episodes because yeah. they're universally acknowledged to be yeah. amazing, the yeah. best. What is your favorite? What's your favorite? Oh my God. I, I, I love that episode, The Wish. I was talking about a lot. Right. I mean, it'd have to be something from season three. I love so many. There's like some one-offs that I really love, like Band Candy, where yes. Giles basically so acts good, like Giles teenager. is the best. Giles, Giles is, is my favorite. Okay. I like, love me too. Giles. He's my favorite character. And in that one where he's like, oh, I'm going to stick my watcher on you. You know, it's <laughs> so much fun. I, I love it. And and that actually, actually comes back to play in that episode of The Body After Joyce Dies. And you see Giles playing that record they were listening to that night. And it was like, oh, my God, what a dagger. So, yeah, things that you notice on a rewatch for that show is so good. We actually, when I showed it to my wife, this is how I knew that she was a keeper. And so I said, okay, it's important to me that you watch these. And she's like, it's got David Boreanaz. Ooh, twist my arm, you know? So okay. <laughs> it's hard to get her to do that, to agree to that. Right, there's right. things for women and men and anyone yeah. who enjoys, you know, either of those people. You've got excellent leads to look at wherever your inclination is. Yeah, I was like, okay, so I got Sarah Michelle Gellar here. I got Charisma <laughs> Carpenter there. Hey, this is fine with me. Anyhow, so we watch those in like a, a chronological order. There is like a chronological order where you watch a, a certain arcs of Buffy and Angel like interacting to make it all kind of play together. So that's when the crossovers really had an impact. And it was just, it was just so much fun. We had so much fun with it. And I'm just glad that she ended up loving it as much as me. Cause I was like, if you don't like this, I might have to file for divorce. You know, like, yeah, <laughs> this is, you know, this, so. this can't happen. It's one of those things I was afraid to show her. Cause there's been like movies. I've been like afraid to show her. Cause I'm like, if she doesn't love it, I don't know if I'm going to process it. Or I think I tried showing her Rambo and she hated it. And I was like, so I'm not going to show her Rocky because I adore Rocky, you know, but then I finally one day I was like, all right, fine, let's watch. Right. And she loved it. She loves the Rocky movies, like all of them. She loves even the bad one. She loves it. And so I was like, okay, so sometimes it works out, but sometimes you just got to learn how to, you know, take that loss and move on. Like she, she loves South Park, but she won't watch basketball. And I'm like, it's, it's just basically live action South Park. What do you not want to watch? But these are things you just got to get used to in a marriage, I think. The most I've ever seen my husband laugh in my entire life was the Disney episode of South Park with the Jonas Brothers. Oh, yeah. He, thinking about that episode now, I just remember like he was crying. I thought he was going to be injured from how much he laughed at that episode. We had just had our first baby. And I'm sure that you remember after you have a baby, um, 
just say the plumbing down there isn't exactly functional yet. And we watched the new episode of South Park of Time was one where the cat is saying Oh Long Johnson over and over again. And she laughs so hard. She's so mad at me because she's peeing herself. I'm like, I didn't do it. Trey and Matt did it. <laughs> so yeah, that's my advice. If you just had a baby, don't watch South Park. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that was probably the, 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 the hardest I ever seen her laugh ever. <laughs> it's good. They, they are uh, very bold and they don't apologize for things. It's so they aren't mad in Canada at South Park for making fun of Canada so much. Cause I feel like they make fun of everything equally. Really. They do. So. I think that's the issue, right? Like as long as you're not, if you, if you're not picking on a, a group of people in particular, mm-hmm. I, you know, I think they, welcome making fun of anyone and everyone that's that's what makes it uh a good show but no i <laughs> my head doesn't open like that <laughs> it'd be a more amusing interview if it did but i don't have any problems with how they portray canadians <laughs> i remember when I saw the south park movie the part where they're like the, the canadian government has apologized for brian adams on several occasions i'm like hey i like brian adams <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, but they, I felt like if you get made fun of by South Park, you've made it, you know. And yeah, you know, that's true. Yeah. Kanye West got all bent out of shape about it. I'm like, dude, relax, calm down. It's like, uh, God, what's his name? Kevin Durant. I don't know how much you follow sports, but Kevin Durant getting mad when people were busting on him about always just like switching to the front runner. And I'm like, chill out, you know, calm down, make fun of yourself a little. Maybe it's just because me. Uh, we like to do uh, self-deprecating humor here, you know, that mm-hmm. we feel like that's very disarming. Well, what I told Christoph was that uh, when you got a face like this, you got to do something to get out in front of that. You know, you got to do some self-deprecating humor first. Then that way you get people to listen to you. They want to make fun of your face the whole time. So I think that's what I kind of appreciate about something like South Park is, you know, hey, let yourself be made fun of once in a while. It's fun. It's good for you. Totally. My husband's a huge World of Warcraft player. He still plays, you know, he's one of the few people who are still left there, but he loves that episode. Like, you know, it's, it's funny. It's, it's funny to watch them poke fun at the things that you love. And uh, he has a pretty good sense of humor anyway, but I, I don't think that. That uh, World of Warcraft episode had me laughing so hard. Oh my God. Bathroom mom. Oh my God. I felt lost my mind. It's too much. Yeah. And basically every bad comments I get is like, this is that guy on that South Park episode where he's just sitting there on his computer eating the Doritos and the guy from World of Warcraft. <laughs> so it's like every bad comment that I get. Just remember, it's it's, it's that guy. You yeah. know, but uh, you know, my wife was interested in World of Warcraft when we got together and I refused to let her do it because I was afraid I'd lose her. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lot. Now, we are a pretty independent couple. Like we enjoy each other's Come company, yeah. but we do a lot of things like, together but apart like in the same room but we're doing the things that we like to do so I just have my chair so I read over there and he reads over here and it, it works out pretty well that, that, I, I don't think that's bad guys I think that's great like I said that uh, I don't watch a lot of tv anymore because pretty much all the tv I watch is stuff that we watch together or if it's something based on a book like I just watch Witcher you know things like that so I just I don't watch it. How do you get so much time to read? Well, if you don't watch TV, you don't use Twitter. You'd be surprised at how much time you have on your hands, guys. Yes, and that's why I say like, no every time you ask me if I've watched something. I'm yeah, like, oh. yeah. So if you you have a uh, if you have a, a, a you know kids that are old enough to entertain themselves, and you don't feel guilty about it, it's like yeah, sure. Just uh, I think that that was a question I got on early on the channel. How do you read so much? As I said that uh, you know just. If your kids are old enough to where they'll leave you alone, and but you're, you're too young to be left alone yet, you, you find yourself with a lot of time to read. But uh, yeah, eliminating TV really, because I used to watch a shit ton of TV. And I think about it now and I'm like, wow, how did I spend that much time watching TV? But I don't know, I guess whatever works for you. I don't game as much as I used to. I never got hooked into this online gaming thing that just kind of takes over people's lives because I was afraid of that. Roommates at the time were all into EverQuest when it came out. And I was like, yeah, you got you just you just lost a really good job at Shell because you got addicted to EverQuest. I'm not doing that. You go to work. Yeah. So. No, and it's also good, oh, you know, works. if if anybody's feeling guilty, it's good for your kids to see you reading. Sit there and read. They they should have time to be bored and play independently. And if you're sitting in the background with a book, they're going to think, well, you know, what makes that so good that my dad or my mom wants to do it all the time. You know, I hate to be back in my day, guy, but uh, I don't understand how these kids are ever bored. I mean, if I had had something as simple 
as a color TV and Netflix, I don't think I would have ever been bored. So right. these kids ever come to me and tell me, like, my kid talking about struggling through playing Halo that he's been asking for for three months because he wants to play the Oculus his grandpa got him. And I saw him, I help him set that all up after we finished this. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, you poor thing. You poor thing. You get to play this incredible new Halo game that you've been begging for, but you want to play your Oculus more. Oh, you poor baby. How are you going to make it? You know? Yeah. My parents, it was like, why don't you go color or something? You know, <laughs> that's what I got. So, yeah, right. It's and it's a totally different, it's a totally different set of expectations now. So I don't know about you, but I, I feel like I was pretty close to my parents. Like I said, I read a lot with my dad. We watched Buffy together. We did a lot of things together. But my parents didn't play with me. Like they didn't have to sit there on the floor and play the games with me that I was playing. Like I either played by myself. And so I was, you know, imagining things or writing things or doing things, or I had my friends. I think that's one of the problems is that you can't have that same group. Like I could go outside my door and there were like eight kids and we would just go off. Like we lived in the woods. So we just went off into the woods together. And then, you know, four hours later, my mom, you would hear it being like, Sarah, (laughs) you had to go home. But now it's, it, it is a, it is a different time but kids need that and I think that is one of the difficulties and why kids are bored so often it's because they need constant entertainment like you you are expected to be their source of entertainment which is I don't think always the best thing I think my parents might have just been more hardcore than we are because like my kid will go play like at one of his friend's house and after an hour I'm like all right where is he (laughs) they used to let us like go off into the woods like you just said for hours not knowing if we were lost or not and they were fine i'm like man maybe they just maybe they were just better at this <laughs> yeah they were less they were less stressed i came home with a stick in my leg once like just poked in there like you said like in red rising like a spear in there and i came i was like mom you gotta take this out it's my turn to be it like you, yeah. gotta, you gotta get this out of my leg yeah, yeah. so i just remember her like pulling it out and we would never do this anymore either, but like taking the bottle of peroxide and just dumping it on top of there and like all of this, you know, white stuff coming out. Sorry, this has gotten gory now. And then being like, okay, put a bandaid on. I got to get back. Outside. Yeah, got to get back and play. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, definitely, definitely a different time for sure. Like, and I'll talk to my mom and she'll be like, oh, well, it was really hard raising you. I'm like, oh God, mom, what, what was, what was the problem raising us? You guys, you had nothing with my generation that you had to make up satanic panic with rock music to find something to be upset about. You guys didn't have social media. You had none of that shit that we got to worry about now as parents. So I was like, don't spare me your things about how hard it was raising Gen X, please. That's the really scary thing. I see this a lot. So my practice, I see a lot of teenagers and social media, like I, I'm not here to judge anybody's lifestyle choices, but it is really the bane of existence. Mm-hmm. Like the, the way that it messes with kids' heads and the way that it makes them feel about themselves is horrible. I think it is like the single worst thing to happen to adolescents ever. And, and it's, it is. It's why they always got confidence, self-confidence anymore. Yeah. I agree. It's terrible. Yeah, it's that's so why I can tell my kid all the time. They, whatever they say is like, who cares? They're losers. Don't worry about it. You know? So I, yeah. thankfully I haven't, I've kept him off of social media at this point. You know, it, he wants a, he wants a smartphone and was like, mm, not yet, buddy. Yeah. So. But it's hard. And then you're stuck in this because it's easy. And this is a lot easier. I think for people who don't have kids to be like, well, just don't buy it for them. But like, then you're stuck in that situation He's where the only you, one who doesn't have one. Yeah, exactly. Like you, literally the only kid who doesn't have something. And it's not about having possessions. It's about connecting with your peers. You also don't want your kid to be isolated. You also don't want them to be the odd person out. You don't want them to feel like they're different from everybody else. So it's a, it's a tough balance. Parenting is hard and technology has improved our lives in many ways, but I think it's made parenting a lot harder. I agree. And the social media thing is one of those. I'm just like, dude, it's, I think I deleted my Twitter a year ago. My mental state at 43 years old is better. And I can imagine at that age, when you're just so uncertain about everything, letting that, because you will, you just, I can say now, yeah, I get nasty comments and I'm like, whatever, you know, I don't care what some stranger in Utah thinks about me, whatever, mm-hmm. you know, I'll, I'll live, you know, but I think about to a kid, like, especially if someone's classmate saying something, like, that's basically what bullying is now. It's just all moved online. It's not physical now. And that's emotional, which in some ways is worse. At least for me, it was like, okay, cool. I got in a fight, you know, got some nicks and cuts and we shook hands and that was it you know it was over 
Yeah. Now it's like they're just tormenting people for years on social media. I'm just like, just get off of it. Just walk away. You'll feel better. So I don't know. But you can't tell that to a kid. And think it's about tough. myself. You couldn't tell me nothing when I was a kid either. So no. You know. <laughs> And it's hard for them to walk away, right? Like when we were in school, even when I was in school, you got, if someone said something, and I think the way that fights happen sometimes between boys and girls, I don't think this means anything inherently about boys or girls. I think it's just the way that the world has, you know, brought us up. It's, it's you know, it has to do a lot with socialization, but the way that fights come across amongst groups of girls can be a little bit different than it does in, in groups of boys. So if you had a group of people who were saying certain things or, you know, like, you know, someone said this about me and they spread this rumor. Like when I went home on Friday, something happened over the weekend that I heard nothing about. And by the time I got back to school on Monday, everybody had forgotten. But now if something starts, you, people are snapping each other about it. And then they're going to, you know, put up an Instagram picture. If you didn't get invited to something, you're going to see all of those stories that somebody else posts. And that's just going to feed into that isolation. So there's no break either. Like, it's not like they can escape because everything that their friends or their classmates or peers are doing follows them home. And it's, it, it is the thing that scares me the most about parenting. Babies, fine. Sleep deprivation, fine. This, how to navigate it, I have no idea. No, I think about that. I mean, I, I got bullied in junior high, but you know what? I got to come home and take yeah. a break from it. You know, now, now it follows them home. That's just, that's, that's awful. That's awful. Yeah. So yeah, I'm just preaching as much as I can. Just stay away from social media. There's nothing good comes out of it. I know you think it's great to, you know, connect with your friends and stuff. And that's how it starts. You know, and that's the way it should be. The way it should be, but you know, for me, social media is a marketing tool. You know, that's just that's really all I really use it for these days. But uh, I mean, the Discord's a little different because you know, I can inflict those rules that I want to make it stay positive and you know, mm -hmm. a mean and controlling bastard about it. So, yeah, and you can't really do that with like Instagram, you know. So, no, it is tough, it is tough. All right, we gotta we gotta move away from these sad topics. Let's yeah, see. Yeah, I know. What... All I was gonna say was, I'm glad that I'm a father of boys, I feel like that's a little easier. So, I think they both, they both have their challenges for sure. And it depends on like your kid's personality. My son grew up with his, his, they're only a year apart. So they were born a year apart. They've had each other forever, their whole lives. So she was his best friend and continues to be his best friend. And so he like, likes a lot of the things that she likes. His hair is very long, very curly. He has like a very kind of feminine looking face. So he gets a lot of like, you're not a boy, you're a girl. When <laughs> and like, there's a lot of um, harshness there too. So I think they, they each have their, their struggles, but it's a, it's a worry no matter what. Well, let's be honest. We're going to worry no matter what happens, right? Exactly. It doesn't matter. It could all go perfectly well and you'd still come up with plenty to worry about. Do you read much sci-fi? I have read like a decent amount of classic sci-fi because I went through a period of time where I read a lot of classics and I included sci-fi classics in that. And I like sci-fi, but I don't love it the same way that I do fantasy, sure. but I have read a little bit. Is there anything that you have on your. Uh, well, I mean, I know we talked about Dune already, but uh, I was looking about getting back into the expanse books this year. Cause I love the TV show. I love the first two books that I read. So I, I don't know. I was looking to get back into that and I was looking at the stuff I had planned. I was like, wow, I have like almost no sci-fi on here this year. It's like all fantasy just about it. I don't want to say that I, I let, uh, you know, stuff that's more popular than Channel Drive, but I'm going to read. I, I don't, but I, I said I am trying to make more of a conscious effort of making sure that I talk about the things that people want to actually listen to, you know, because yeah. I, I realized the Crichton stuff was a niche topic. Hell, even King is kind of a niche topic on, on, on book two, you know, so, uh, but I was just like, I'll talk about sci-fi or horror, doesn't really do move the needle at all. You know, yeah. I talked about Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Like, no one was interested. Like, almost no one. Right. And it's so, Hitchhiker's Guide. I know, which is wild. You know, you would it think is. that. So, uh, I don't know. I was just looking at my, my TBR. I was like, it is like 90, 95% fantasy this year. You know, so uh, I don't know. I was just curious how, how you felt about that. I mean, I know that we all have our favorites, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I don't know. Any any, any other sci fi series you, you kind of got on your radar at all or anything? I just read Children of Time by Adrian Tchaikovsky, which I really liked. Everybody, I went in, it is fairly hyped because everybody says that it's so good, but I did really like it. It has a, a lot of cool, um, like anthropological discussions in there. It was not at all what I was expecting out of a sci-fi book, but I, I ended up really liking it. Are you going to read book two? Yeah. Yep. I'm going to go on and read book two. Is he going to write a book three for that? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm really not sure. I don't think so. I, Cause I haven't heard anybody mention it. There were some people who are pretty big fans. 
I hadn't even heard this. of this guy before Children of Time. And now I see this guy's got like 50 books. I'm like, what he's is got the huge backlog? Like he just, he just finished like some 10 book series. I'm like, what mm-hmm. in the world? I never even heard of this guy until a couple of years ago. So it's crazy. I did, uh, Alan over at Library of Alexandria, he, he, he carries on about his, his, uh, his actual fantasy books. About how yeah, good that's this, are, the so. Shadows of the App series. I know he just read the first. Yeah. Five yeah, that's the them. 10 book series. I think that he just, yep. that he just finished. I'm like, wow, that's, that's crazy. And I thought, are these like novellas or something? I'm like, no, these are big old boys too. <laughs> so I'm like, geez, so these guys are not just prolific, but he's got stuff. And he's got just like some of the best covers. His covers are yes. awesome. They're he beautiful. Really does do that. So well, that's, 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 that's cool. I, I, I was going to check out him. I was going to check out Alistair Reynolds is the one I get asked about a lot. Mm-hmm. Gene Wolfe is the big one. I'm like, look, after Malazan, my brain needs a break before I get to something that complex again. So uh, Book of the New Sun is one of my most requested. But, you know, Malazan was one of my most requested before I did it, you know, <laughs> and yeah, you get past about the halfway point. People are like, oh, you're still doing that, huh? Most people never make it this far. Why is this? Why is this still here? Um, who was I going to say? John Scalzi is a pretty accessible sci-fi writer. I've got writer. the first three old man's war books, but yeah. Yeah. So they're good. Like, and those are pretty easy to toss on the TBR and use as like filler. Those months where you read all the things that you have to read is pretty, yeah. his prose is accessible. I like the old man's war, like the books that he, he read. I did not read them all. I read the first few, I think, but I like them. My dad has read all of them and or all the ones that are out. I don't know if it's finished or not. And he really likes it. Yeah. I like the concept behind it. It's a really neat battle. Old people are basically more value than the, the young infantry types. It's a, <laughs> That's something I'm finding myself relating to more and more these days. But uh, uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, the the Ender's Game books are, are ones that I'd like to kind of add because I love the first Ender's Game book, but I've never read anything else. Really? Um, I've, I've Well, I've, I say really as if I've read them all. My dad has read all of those as well. I've only read Ender's Game and Ender's Shadow, but I like them both. Yeah, uh, Ender's Game is great. Uh, that's one that uh, really I would really like to get my my, my youngest interested in. It's crazy about that is when I was in business school, they recommended two books as – not required, but recommended reading was The Art of War and Ender's Game. Because they both teach you a lot of things about negotiating, about working as a team, stuff like that. I was like, well, I don't see myself ever, you know, feeling the need to get a samurai sword out of the business meeting. But I mean, I guess it, I guess it's, you know, when you got to get really aggressive with those negotiations, you know, mm-hmm. worse comes to worse, right? But so my secret Santa actually got me a Art of War for, for, for Christmas this year. So nice. That's pretty mm-hmm. exciting. Never, never read it. Never read it. That's a, that's one that should be interesting to, to, to get into and, see how it applies to business. I feel like that's one of those books that everybody owns or like says they've read or has on yeah. their shelf, but maybe hasn't read. I also have a copy, but I, I have not read it. What's the most off the wall thing that you've read? You think no one would expect that you would have read. I know it's a loaded question, but it weird. is, it is. Um, I've read some of the novelizations from world of Warcraft. <laughs> <laughs> like some of those you I've know the halo ones books yeah i've read some of the that, halo ones that come out and i actually like them i i like some of the the lore there and i haven't played a lot of warcraft i played for like a one year period with my husband but i find that like online gaming communities can be tough and my husband's like skill level far exceeds mine so i think if we would go into like a dungeon or do something together people would be like oh great you can come and then i was kind of the tag along maybe like what the fuck are you doing? Like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just trying to have fun. <laughs> so I uh, I don't play anymore, but I did like those. So that's kind of you know, well, it's a little bit. I mean, people at this point, I'm sure people know I'm a huge nerd, so it's probably not that off the wall, but it's probably like the most out there. It's thing kind of I funny, think. is I, I just brought back this memory when I was younger. I was completely obsessed with Nintendo, the original Nintendo. I mean, what kid in my generation wasn't? And I remember going to, you remember when you used to have book fairs in, in junior high? Uh, so they had these things called Masters of Power. And it was like novelizations of NES games. And I got one for like Blaster Master, Ninja Gaiden, and Metal Gear. And I loved them. And like looking back, I'm like, those were terrible, dude. What were you doing? You're making, you know, it's like eight. So it worked out just fine. But yeah, that's what that just made me think of is those, I'm going to look those up. I bet you those are probably like on eBay for like $50 now or something crazy like that. But yeah, it's. I feel like remember a few years back, not a few, it's been longer than a few years back now, but when it was like, oh yeah, they could, wish they could make a good superhero movie. And now it's like all they make really. So I'm still at that point where I'm like, wish they could make some good video game movies. You know? yeah. so maybe, maybe that's next. I think Arcane is is paving the way. I think, you know, whether you watch it or not, it was a great, uh, it was a great video game. Is that adaptation. League of Legends? Is that all it is? Yeah. League, of, yeah. League of Legends. Wow. Yeah. I see the ads all the time for League of Legends. 
Yeah. Also another game that I like dipped my toe into very briefly, but could not handle, could not handle the intensity people. We will say that they're passionate. I will put a positive spin on this and I will say that they're very passionate about that game and my skill level. So I used to live in uh, my first year med school. We, re- we rented this huge house. So it was me, my husband, my two younger sisters, and one of my younger sister's boyfriends. There were all of us living there and they were all really big into League of Legends and they were all really good at it. And I was like, well, you know, I want to join in on family time. And so I get in on these games and people are just like, who let this idiot in here? I'm <laughs> like, I'm sorry. <laughs> I tried getting into the online gaming thing when Destiny came out. Mm-hmm. And I got into some of those PVP scenarios and basically I was dragging everyone else down. I was like, I just, this is not for me. So I went ahead and, and tapped out. No one was quite like that, but I could tell they were like, oh, it's fucking Mike's fucking everything up here. So I was like, yeah, I was going to go ahead and go back to, you know, playing in my single player campaign offline. Yeah, I, I peeked at the side scroll. That is, that is where my video gaming abilities were at their height. Yeah, but I got the interesting thing was my wife was really into game. When I met her, she was really into Elder Scrolls, which is you know mm-hmm. Skyrim, Oblivion, and things like that. And I had never actually played those games before, so she's the one who actually got me into that stuff. So, uh, yeah, the fact that I could get her to watch Buffy, the fact that she was already a gamer, that was like, like okay, cool. And she's a redhead who's not going to kill me, I don't think, at least not yet. <laughs> I was like, okay, well, hey, I found myself a winner, right? And she didn't smoke. That was a big thing for me. I was like, I didn't want to smoke her because if you're not a smoker, you don't want to be with a smoker. I'm sorry if. if you smoke, that's great. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that if you aren't a smoker, living with one is impossible. You can't yeah. do it. It's too, it's too tough. I don't know how she stomachs me being a coffee drinker when she can't stand coffee. So, I mean, you drink coffee? I don't. I don't drink any any caffeinated beverages. How, how do you do it? That's amazing. I know, right? It was it was uh, a feat. So, in when I was in med school, we did a lot of all-nighters. And I... I don't know. I, I sleep really well. So when I can sleep, I yeah, because you don't quickly. drink caffeine. Of course you sleep well. Yeah. <laughs> so that made up for it, I guess. Yeah. You just get it's whatever you get used to. Wow, that's amazing. Oh, that's I just I think about all the stuff like because you know, when the keto life, which I've completely neglected this month, by the way, <laughs> uh you get used to giving up so many things and you realize it's not that big of a deal. It really isn't. Like I thought I would die without sugar. And I'm like, oh, they feel great without sugar. I got way more energy than I had when I use sugar. Cause I mean, like, sugar. Yeah. Great. I got an energy burst. It's gone in five minutes, you know, or people that drink like those energy drinks and stuff. And I'm like, okay, I never had to do that, but it's like coffee. So one thing I don't think I would ever give up caffeine complete this period. Cause I don't think I can do it at this point. So. I don't it's know. been it's just, been too long. No, I don't. Uh, and you work in those crazy shifts and yeah. work and making it without coffee. That's incredible. Wow, you're superhuman. Yeah, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I think you might be a machine. <laughs> That's the real secret. The, uh, the the story I was going into with my wife there was a, it, I got her into Diablo. We were playing Diablo, and I think mm-hmm. that's that's a good transition. I think if you played only like side scroller games, it's just overhead, but it's very simple two D kind of thing. So. Uh, well, that could be something that you guys could try out together, maybe. I don't know. This has been Diablo was the game that I bought for my first boyfriend. It was the first present that I ever bought for him. And the first present he ever bought for me was a Valentine's Day gift. And it was Carrie by Stephen King. <laughs> and you didn't marry that one? Wow. It was. I know. Right. I know. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> but it was a good it was a good gift. Wow, that's pretty good. I think about the uh, Valentine's gift. See, our anniversary uh, is in October, but our, our dating anniversary is like right around Valentine's Day. So we just kind of always still celebrate that. She doesn't like to go out on holidays because she doesn't like people. Yep. You know, she's a teacher. Of course, she doesn't that. like people. Mm-hmm. So uh, she's always, we always have this tradition on Valentine's Day is we'll just, uh, we'll fix a nice, we'll switch roles. Uh, basically what, what we do is someone fixes a nice dinner and the other person will pick a classic love movie to watch a romance movie from like 1950s or before mm-hmm. and everywhere we just kind of switch that one person picks a movie and the other person cooks it's just kind of what we've always done and that's some really good movies that way i think and uh Faso felt like okay she really over over she really beat me with her meal last year. So I got to try harder this year. You know, so this is you guys, that is, that is great. We do the same thing all the time, which is we order pizza, we drink beer and we watch either star Wars or Lord of the Rings. Well, that <laughs> sounds better. Honestly. I mean, let's be real here. Uh, she doesn't drink beer. You know, she's never drank beer. Uh, I used to, that was one of those things I gave up when I, when I started. That doesn't fit the keto, the keto lifestyle, sadly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, 
And the thing is, like, you think you try to go back to it because I do like to get me some holiday beers around this time. And it's like two of them, and you're like kissing the carpet. It's like, wow, I used to be able to just put down like a 12 pack and drive home. This is wild, right? So it's amazing how that works. But uh, no, uh, just having beer and pizza and watching Lord of the Rings, man, that's how you stay together right there. Right. Pretty that's good. yeah, that's the stuff. That's, that's what the long lasting relationships are. How long have you guys been together? We have been together for 30. 15 years maybe now we, we this will be we'll be married for 10 this year uh but we we're together for three or four years before that maybe yeah same with us same with us yeah, yeah. yeah great yeah we uh, just hit uh what 11 married and 14 together i think so yeah, yeah. yeah about three years three years before kids guys before marriage that's the way to do it that's yeah. the way that <laughs> and again the couples that gain together the couples that watch together those are the couples that stay together and the mm-hmm. couples that read together always stay together. I'm trying to get her to read this dragon bone chair. This uh, Tad Williams series with me starting in January, but she's kind of, mm-hmm. she's kind of iffy. So that looks pretty chunky. And I'm like, so, you know, <laughs> here's the deal is when we first started dating, I was like, have you read a song of ice and fire? You got to check this series out. Cause I had no idea it wasn't ever going to be finished at that time. So I was mm-hmm. like, it's not done yet, but you know, I, it'll be done. Don't worry about it. It's okay. Famous she loves one. it. So now anytime I recommend a series to the first thing she asks me, is it done? Yes, <laughs> it's done. I would not recommend you a series that isn't done. And now she's like, you recommended Red Rising to me. And it's not done. I'm like, hey, the part that you read is done. You it know, will. so <laughs> so, so I get that. So anytime I recommend a series to her now, that she's like, nah, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what happens. But she really got into that. Uh, do you guys have out there, was it a serial podcast where it's like unsolved or wrongly prosecuted kind of people where they just investigate things like that there's some podcast that got really big out here called serial yep i have heard of it i i haven't listened to it once she listened that she fell down a rabbit hole only wanting to read like nonfiction stuff of people being you know wrongly prosecuted spending you know life sentences in jail for crimes they didn't commit and stuff and so she really got away from like reading like uh you know fiction that kind of broke my heart a little bit i mean if i'm being honest so the fact that I kind of slowly got, she just, she just read Ryera Revelations. Uh, she read uh, Red Rising, like I said. Uh, I got to read Long Walk because I know that she really liked the dystopian thing for a while there. Which, by the way, she said Long Walk was just okay. And I was like, hmm. That hurts. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a rough one. That's so I'm painful. trying to try to get that. I still haven't been able to get her into First Law. I have tried so many times to get her to try First Law, and she just will not do it. But I don't know. We were on our, our uh, anniversary trip. We were in Jamaica and she has it on her because I put it on her Kindle and she thought about first law for a minute. And I got like so stupid excited. And then she decided to do Ryer instead, which I was like, all right, that's fine. But so I feel like it's possibility now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's good. Well, it's, you just got to, you know, ease her into it. Yeah. So do you do that at all? Do you try to really like a book and you just want to talk to your spouse about it so much you try to get him to read it? Yes. And now he doesn't trust me anymore after I got to read Margaret Atwood. <laughs> See, here, here's the thing is she was so glad when I started doing this because yeah. that way I stopped talking to her about all these things that she had no idea what I was talking about. But I won't lie. I think now she's a little bit jealous sometimes. She's like, well, That's, you never yeah. talk to me about these things. <laughs> Andrew watches all the videos. He's very good that way. Um I think there are definitely some that he wants to read. He reads more sci-fi than I do. So he has read more classic sci-fi and he will be more likely to pick up sci-fi than I am. He, I think his big thing now is he really wants me to read some of the Star Wars books. And maybe once I do that, he will then, assist, like he will acquiesce to my So request. he's read Star Wars EU books, like the original Extended oh yeah so he is very intense like he he is very I, I'm, I'm sure probably you guys have some opinions that would line up so he refuses to even buy because he doesn't own all of them but he refuses to buy the ones that say legends because he's like no yeah, <laughs> disney has not. like spat on everything that i loved and i refuse to buy one of those reprinted books that yeah. that labels this legend so he is really hardcore so i really like star wars he loves star wars yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's just heartbreaking to, to to where it is now and how it just nothing. All it does, it usually be just like this one thing that was for everybody and everyone. We can't stay each other, but oh, we both love Star Wars. And we'll talk about Star Wars. Like I think about me and my brother, six years apart in age, couldn't talk about anything, but we could always talk about Star Wars, you mm-hmm. know, or Star Trek after Star Trek Next Generation came out. That was pretty much like it. So now the fact that this franchise that I've always felt like was just something that anyone could talk about, now it doesn't make people fight. And I'm like, ah, this is how the internet has ruined everything is that it took something that was always just universal and for everyone. Now it just makes people fight. That's an unreal. Even the internet could ruin that. 
Yeah. Sad. yeah. He was really sad because it came out, the first new movie came out, I think. Force Awakens. Yeah, I actually liked Force it Awakens. at the time. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't bad. Yeah. And it came out around the time our daughter was born, I think, and or like close around that time. And he was excited. He was like, you know what? This is going to be great because now when she gets a little bit older, there's going to be a Star Wars movie with a female lead and she's going to like she's going to love it. And that's going to be something that we can love together. And he was a little bit like he was okay on on movie one. My dad was furious from the beginning, like from from the first movie. And he Andrew was like, no, I'm like tentatively, maybe it'll be okay from here. And then he saw the second movie and he was just like, no. I was an hour <laughs> into the second movie and I was like, they done fucked it up already. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Like it they were was cutting uh, the same cloth there. But yeah, I mean, I was, I was so excited to take my kids to see Star Wars, a new Star Wars movie and stuff. Yeah. So, I, mean, mm-hmm. I enjoyed it for what it was, but now I'm just like, yeah, oh, we enjoyed we watching watch Mandalorian. Mandalorian. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, we did watch The Mandalorian, which was enjoyable. I liked it. And I think that he would be open to more non Jedi based Star Wars material, maybe, because I think he's just not going to ever forgive them for what they did to, to the Jedi. So yeah. he may be open to watching some other things just that are, you know, set in that universe but not following the main the main story yeah my my kids think that luke skywalker's a hero so even he hated that man i didn't influence him at all i want him to make up his own mind on this stuff and he saw that movie and he hated it and he was like i don't yeah. like what they did to luke <laughs> i think this is like a at the time like a six-year-old so i didn't like what they did to luke so yeah yeah. that's how you know they, they fucked up bad uh, i mean it's one of those things i feel like it's a you always say that was a unbreakable franchise but i was like i've never seen interest as low in star wars as it is right now and right. so uh, you know, not, not, nothing is you know the golden goose that can't eventually be uh be ruined who knows but i also think all it takes is one great movie and it'll be back yep. one great movie it'll be back but i mean uh i think i feel like for this generation the the marvel movies are their star wars though you know yes because i mean yeah. i just took my kid to see the new spider-man and he loved it you know I, hell i loved it I really want to see it. We don't have a movie theater here, so we can't see it. And unfortunately, Newfoundland just went back into like a significant lockdown. Uh, Uh, So we're not we're also not allowed to go out and see it right now. So we had hoped to go out over the break and see it. And now we can't. So I really don't want to be spoiled for it. But I have a feeling that being on the Internet is going to make that. You know, I feel like those places that are locked down, they should allow those movies to be streamed or something or, you know, to buy a video on demand. Uh, Because I feel like I know people in Australia right now who still can't see dune because they won't let them leave their house and they want to go see dune uh, i feel awful i feel awful talk about being on different planets it's like huh well i just went to the grocery store today and it's like no big deal you know so i don't know yeah Weird. and it's hard and i guess i think australia and newfoundland are probably in similar situations that because of geography because it's an island yeah. people feel like they can exert more control over things so like okay if we take these measures our geography can work with us, but you know, the continental U S is a bit of a different, a bit of a different story. Like you can't do the same thing, but it is, it's, it's disappointing. And, you know, I think when lockdown first happened, it didn't bother me as much for one reason. I already was a homebody. I already, oh, <laughs> so no, I'll stay home and read. Okay. Nothing really changed, yeah. but I felt bad for the kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My kids just not being able to go do anything. That's why I kind of felt, you know, we had to cancel our Disney trip and things like mm-hmm. that, you know, which we're still planning to do next year, hopefully, you know, but Even their uh, perception of what school is like now, if, if people get sick, like if my kids get a cold, they're like, Oh, you know, is the school going to shut down? I'm like, <laughs> no, it's not, but it's the, the, like, that's what they equate it with in their mind. Now, like school is not a constant thing it's something that can be interrupted you might spend months not going it's it's a really strange way to enter the school system yeah i tell i tell my kids like you guys have already had more time off school than i have my entire career Life. <laughs> okay so i don't want to ever hear about how oh we only get two weeks for christmas you poor thing yeah you know so i was like, you guys got like six months off of school shut up you know so that yeah i had to do the Basically, I left the workforce to go back to school full time and finish school. And like right when I was about to graduate, this all happened. That's and then my it. school was virtual only. There's our school. So I had to stay home with them and, and homeschool them. And guys, I don't know if you know this. It is not easy. It is not easy. So don't give teachers hard times because oh I, gosh. yeah, just trying to do it here was impossible. It was yeah. impossible. And that was with them already having the lesson planning and stuff for you. It was just it was not a good thing. So the minute that they said they could go back to school, it took some convincing for my wife to send the kids back. But uh, yeah, 
I was, I was thankful that it happened because yes, my, there was no question with my husband. So he is a stay at home dad. He, ha- he has been like, since they were born and when school closed for six months, he was like, take them, take them yes. back. Yeah. They need to, they need to go, but it's important for them too to see, like, it's all a balance, obviously. Like there, there's pros and cons to everything, but kids need other kids. That is a fact. Yeah. yeah so you guys learn how to you know work together and stuff like that. I think more isolation probably isn't the same. I'm always about safety. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me yeah. wrong. But I was like, yeah, at a point where it's like, okay, let's, uh, let's just change this topic because it's not going to get anywhere good. Is it? <laughs> I'm sorry. I feel like this is always what happens. So you get a group of us together. And this is why Andrew hates like hanging out with me and my friends, because no matter what, it is always going to devolve to medicine because that is what everybody has in common. And when you have kids, as I'm sure, you know, you get a bunch of like parent friends together. That's that is also what happens. You Yeah, we have the voice chat on my Discord. And like there's a there's some some younger people who get on there and like, oh, you guys just all start talking about your kids. I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> like someday you'll realize, guys, that's that's just like that age, it's pretty much your life is you yep. know, that's you, all the talk, all you so, got to talk about. It's all you can talk about, really. So I mean sometimes it's like, hey, we didn't talk about books for five minutes, guys. You know, you, you'll be okay. You'll be okay. It's all right. It's all right. So any plans for the rest of a uh, vacation? So I only have one more day tomorrow, oh, okay. my last day. Uh, I took the week off before. So my birthday is three days before Christmas. So I usually take that week before Christmas off. And then I do like the birthday celebrations and the preparation stuff for Christmas. And then this year, the stat days are today. And do people get so cheap get on you? Do they get you one gift for birthday and Christmas? No. So my parents were really good about that. Um, okay. They were very, very stringent. My, my parents are both very, uh, I would call it OCPD being in psychiatry or being in psychiatry, like very black and white. Like these are the rules and we need to follow them. So they're very like, this is what we do for one child. And so this is what we do for the other ones. Right, so there was right. not a lot of Christmas and birthday stuff. Um, but it's nice, actually. Most people are in high spirits this time of year. I know it can be a struggle for for some people, uh, but usually people are in a pretty good mood. So I have liked having a holiday birthday. It's worked out. I'm never in school. I was never in school, university time. I was always out. Exams were over and I didn't have to worry about any of that stuff. So I'm, I'm good with that, that time of year. The OCBD thing that you just talked about is, is someone who just, we were in the room the night before Christmas counting to make sure they both had the same number of presents. <laughs> I understand that. I understand that a lot because my youngest is, uh, he's on the spectrum. So, uh, yeah, he's not going to understand. Well, your brothers are a little more expensive than yours. He's going to be mad that his brother doesn't have the same number that he has and not, not in a selfish way. And like, he thinks that Brendan needs to have as many gifts as he has. Cause he had, yeah, like that. He had some smaller toys, you know? So, I uh, tried to explain to him, like, well, you've probably got some stupid, high, expensive stuff, but let me go to the dollar store and get some little cheapy gifts to make sure you guys right. have the same number of gifts. So that's, you know, in his world, that's everything is his older brother, you know, so he's got to make sure that we're taking care of his older brother. You know? That's nice, though. That's the, that's the sweet thing of it. So it's a a, a challenge, but uh, in some ways it's like, okay, well, you know, he's keeping us honest, you know, good for him. Yeah. You know, so. uh, I actually take the week after Christmas every year because... If you combine that with New Year's, you you basically get almost like two weeks off work, which so is great. A, yeah. a little hack, so that's what I always do. But this being my first year back to work, uh, yeah, it's been a it's been an adventure for sure trying to do this and that. But uh, again, this being a side thing, it, this could be something that uh, if it ended tomorrow, I would be sad because I built so many new relationships off of it. And uh, like I said, just going off of the messages I get, influence a lot of people in a positive way. Everybody, the positive sends me a message that you positive or negative, but saying, Hey, you got me to read this. That's I, I consider that a win, you know, and getting more people to read because I don't know about the numbers there, but in the states, the number of people reading just goes down more and more and more and more every year. I feel like Audible's bringing it back up a little bit. People are more people are listening to, to audiobooks now than you know weren't a couple of years ago. So that, that that's that's somewhat of a good thing. That's why I'll always be in favor of audiobooks if that's mm-hmm. the way that consuming a product works for you. you know, like people who do chores and they have a commute or they have a job where they can listen to headphones. That's great if you can do mm-hmm. that. I think that it very much counts. Now a lot of people be like, oh it doesn't count. What I don't like though, like I said, is when people are like, oh, I didn't really remember much of that, but I listen to it on like four speed. And I'm like, what are you listening to Alvin and the Chipmunks? I mean, what, how, right. how does that, how does that even sound natural to you? I try to listen to audiobooks, and it's just in one ear and out the other. I just, I, I said, just too many years of blocking out kids. I think you can't turn that off, you know? So uh, it's a skill, a skill that you develop. 
Um, what I'm going to do tomorrow, so I'm really excited about this. I am recording a video and this is, this is a good example of community. This is what I love about booktube. So I really love Dresden, as I said, so I'm recording a video tomorrow that I have prepared that is for me as a first time reader, what I think, oh gosh, sorry, what I think of as the like 10 most pivotal moments in the first half of the Dresden files. So books one through eight, like the 10 mo moments that I think have had the biggest influence on the series that are really like projecting where it's going to go. I could be totally wrong because I don't know what happens in the back half of the series, but I'm, I'm super excited to, to talk about it. But because I haven't read this, the second half of the series and I wanted to do this with like some picture overlay, some artwork and those kind, kinds of things, like put a little bit more into it because I'm on vacation than I typically can when I'm recording a video. And someone from the Discord like volunteered to look up the artwork for me so that I wouldn't get spoiled and like pick out ones that were good quality that I could reference. And it's just nice. People just want to have that connection with other people who enjoy the same things as them. And, and that's the best part about BookTube is making those relationships, meeting those friends. That is far and away the best part of it. Yeah, no, it definitely is because I've when I was doing it, I was like, I have no one to talk to these books about. I was like, I know no one in real life that reads fantasy, like mm -hmm. at all. I knew one person, but I mean, even us, we were still, he was going to medical school and stuff. So he was reading like one book every like six months. So it was like, yeah, I don't have anyone to talk to about these books, especially Stephen King. I really wanted to just talk about someone with Stephen King, but complete accident for me because I didn't know this community even exists. Mm -hmm. I started making those wheel of time videos just to help me remember while I was going through the books. I had no idea that this was a thing. So yeah, the Discord is just, all the people like, I had no idea there was this kind of community for books. Like, me neither, you know? So um, yeah, I'm, I'm thankful for that. So I was like, finally, there is something good on the internet. I found my people, you know, people who like to, who choose to read over, you know, watching the movie. You know, it seemed like so long all my friends were like, oh, I'll just watch the movie. Mm -hmm. And I was always like, oh, I'm going to read the book first, then I'll see the movie. So I feel like I finally found those people, you know, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm happy for that. That's the best How are you feeling? I'm speaking of like books and movies. You just watched Wheel of Time. How are you feeling about the upcoming, I guess we can't even really call it Lord of the Rings, but like the upcoming Middle Earth adaptation that is in the works? I'm trying to, here's the thing I've noticed about YouTube as a content creator is if you have a channel where you're mostly positive, you get a decent audience. If you have a channel where you're completely just negative on everything, you have a massive audience, massive, massive. Yeah. I mean, like go on right now and look at everyone who's doing level-headed, rational discussions about the new Wheel of Time episodes, a few thousand views. Someone mm -hmm. who's like, this is the worst fucking thing ever. 100,000 <laughs> views. I mean, same thing happened with Star Wars. Same thing happened with Game of Thrones. It's just, that's just kind of what YouTube has become. It's just become that thing where even if you don't feel that way, act that way because it's going to get you lots of ad revenue and lots of clicks and lots of attention. Now, I'm not saying those people don't feel that way. I'm just saying that there, there's a bigger audience for that. So uh, with the Lord of the Rings thing, I've seen those type of videos. So I'm trying to be like, let's just wait and see. I'm always a wait and see on this. Uh, mm -hmm. With me, I'm like, they aren't really following anything that Tolkien did. So I'm kind of like. Skeptical. Let's see. You know, I mean, I see how much money they're spending on it and stuff. So I'm like, I don't know. It, it's a wait and see for me. I, I'll be honest. I'm not expecting anything great i didn't expect anything great with witcher or will of time you know mm -hmm. I, I think it's just so many years of watching fantasy adaptation just be terrible yeah that i was still just like just expected to be bad you know so i i want to believe uh, but you know there were a lot of people involved on it that have already dropped out for creative differences and that has me concerned and these were like yeah. tolkien scholars that are doing this and stuff so that has me concerned i mean it's just I, I don't know. I, I'm trying to say I'm not going to be like the Wheel of Time fans who are really mad right now. Uh, but <laughs> I, I might be because, you know, that's my favorite fantasy series ever is, yeah. is, is Lord of the Rings. So uh, I'd like to see it done great. But right now it's just, you know, cautious optimism. But I definitely want to give it a chance. Yeah, you know, I, I find to... like I have the same. I don't have any investment in Wheel of Time. I've never read it. It doesn't mean anything to me. Lord of the Rings means a lot to me. And the first adaptation came out of nowhere right like yeah. at least for for me i didn't even know that it was happening until i was sitting in a movie oh no theater. i was following development on. diaries and everything back on message boards in the early no i didn't even own a computer when yeah. the first lord of the rings movie came out so i was in a dark theater and the drums of moria just played in the dark and i was like what 
is happening. And it was just, you know, it, it was a, a, a filmmaking experience that is going to be def- difficult. Had you read them first though? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. 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 I had already loved it. I had read them. I loved it. I was so excited and it was, and they were amazing. And I just, I, I am very worried about this. It was interesting actually. So my dad and I were there for, we went to this really small movie theater. So there's a small town near my very small town that we went to see all of the Lord of the Rings movies. And we would always go on the date of release to the first showing And there was one other guy and he was this like super tall, skinny, like kind of gaunt looking guy with a long trench coat. And I was young when the movies came out. So I used to call him the vampire guy. And it was just the three of us who were there, like in the back row, sitting beside each other for each of these Lord of the Rings movies, whenever they came out. And you could tell, like, we were the hardcore Tolkien fans when they came out. And it was, I don't know, it was just a good experience. I feel like maybe it's just because I'm not a kid anymore, but things don't hit the same way. I don't know. I think it's just one of those things where it's hard to catch lightning in a bottle twice. Cause I think those mm-hmm. are just the right time, the right people behind it and stuff. Cause I mean, they even got the same people together to try to make the Hobbit. It didn't work out. It did not. It didn't work out, you know? So it's just like, you try to recapture something like that. It's, it's really hard to do. And I just, I felt like the people that were involved that made the Lord of the Rings trilogy great as a passion project, they aren't the ones behind this. So I don't yeah. feel like as much love is going to be put into it as was in this original three movies because I mean, second one had, had Warner Brothers behind it and Warner Brothers likes to do things their way or they'll replace you, you know. Whereas New Line was like, hey, we're just going to take, we're going to roll the dice, we're going to take a gamble here, and they let Peter Jackson make what he made to make, you know. So yeah. uh, with this, I have a hard time believing that these people are going to be better, you know. So, but I also don't want to just discount it and be like, ah, oh, it's going to be terrible. I try not to be that guy. I try to be positive on these things, but if I was saying that I'm expecting greatness, I would be an absolute liar. Liar. So. This is what, so I, I, I too try to be positive. And so this is me trying to hype myself up for the Cowboy Be- Bebop adaptation oh, that came yeah. out this year. It's the one TV show that I decided, like, I'm going to watch this when this How comes out. And it? I, I watched the first episode and I was like, sorry. That was me <laughs> with Lock and Key. I was really excited because I love the Joe Hill comic of Lock mm-hmm. and Key. One episode, I turned it off. I was like, that is not the series at all. It was not a CW tween show. And that is exactly what you basically cut out all the violence and put in a bunch of teen drama. And I was like, bye, I'm not yeah. even going to suffer through that. And that's my attitude. My, my attitude with adaptation is if you're going to do that, I'm just going to walk away. I'm not going to keep watching it just a bitch every week. Yes. Like I see a lot of people doing with, with Witcher and Will of Time right now. I'm not, I'm not that guy. I will just walk away. You know, I didn't watch the new Star Wars movie when it came out because I was like, I don't care anymore. I'm not no, going to keep just... giving you my money for you to tell me I'm a toxic fan because I didn't like what you did to Luke Skywalker, you know? So I'm like, yeah. that's my attitude with these things. If, if I'll watch the, I'll probably give myself like a three episode limit with Lord of the Rings. And if I don't like it after that, I'm like, all right. You'll let it well, go. Yeah. I am I am cautiously optimistic about the Sandman adaptation. I'm hopeful that at they least might Bill Gaiman's involved in that. Exactly. You know? yeah. Yes. And he's done stuff for TV before. I actually didn't I didn't watch American Gods. The, I like the Good Omens though. Good, good Omens was good great. Omens was excellent. Yeah, I did I did end up watching that. So that was see a TV show. I watched one. <laughs> I watched Good Omens, but I, I am optimistic about Sandman. So you read Sandman? It was a really long time ago that I read Sandman. So I am now rereading them and I have found that there's a lot of stuff that I have forgotten. Yeah, so I am rereading them yeah. in anticipation of the adaptation. So I read them in the nineties when they were basically new and uh, yeah. yeah, completely just blew me away. Yeah. And so they started doing these things on audible, these uh, new recordings and whatever. So what I started doing was trying, cause I had a free audible credit. Mm-hmm. I was like, well, I don't listen to audiobooks, but okay, I'll buy that and figure I'll do this. I would put in the headphones while I'm rereading it and just kind of listen as I was going. And I, it was really cool doing it that way. Uh, mm-hmm. I liked it a lot, but uh, yeah, I was like, I don't remember hardly anything from this, but yeah, right. it's very good. It's still aged really well, I think. And like the, some of the characters you remember, cause you're like, yes, yeah, this person was awesome. Or like this moment was so good, but there's so much from like, <laughs> did I, did I read this? Now I'm going back on my own word. I'm like, when you read things over time, you remember a lot, but I, I do find comics are a little bit harder to retain because there's the pictures and, and everything. I kind of stopped following it because it was just everybody fighting about the casting choices. And I'm like, yeah. all right, I'm going to skip that part, you know, because yes, well, this character is supposed that. to be black. This character is supposed to be a female and not, or something like that. I just, I just I'll wait to see uh, what they what they present because uh, I got to the point where it was like if you're still whining about some of the casting choices on Wheel of Time, 
you're not going to ever like the show. That, that That's kind of where I'm at. I mean, if I'm real easy on that, if it doesn't change the story, I don't care about it. I mean, like Battlestar Galactica, they, they, they turned Starbuck into a chick and she was awesome. You know, I had no problem with it because it was awesome. Now dark tower, what they did with Roland. Yeah. That changed the story completely. So, you know, I can, I can see those things a little bit, but um, like I said, I just, I just walk away. I just walk away. I don't, I don't harp on it, but maybe I should. Apparently that's how you get like a hundred million subscribers is just not being <laughs> a jerk on YouTube, you know, saying how everything sucks and everything ruined your childhood. So I don't know. I don't know. It's too positive in that, that, that regard. Are you looking, are you going to read Saga when it starts up? Are you starting up with it when the issues? You know, are I feel like I've been waiting so long. I started thinking, I was like, hell, I don't even remember where it ended at this point. Three years. You have to remember where it ended. It was a very dramatic ending. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure if I think about it, I probably, wow. Well, yeah, I think but so. But it has I been, it's so. been a long hiatus. But I'm, sure. I'm just saying I might go back to like the last like three issues or so and kind of reread to, I'm not going to do a full reread, even though I could, because it's fantastic. But uh, yeah, I got those hardcover collections of that, but I saw March, the new, new, new issue comes out in March, but I'm kind of curious if I'm going to read those monthly or if I'm just going to like, let like, you know, six of them build up at a time, a volume and just read them that way. I haven't decided yet because uh, I don't know. It's a hard they, Brian K. Vaughn isn't exactly fast on those, you know? So, I mean, even I before I, the hiatus, they weren't fast. They were not. I'm hoping that the the what has been happening in the world has has lengthened it a little bit. And at least they both of them say that there is a finite arc that they have the story planned. They know where it's going. They know where it's ending. That gives me hope. Let's hope because I feel like that's like probably like the last great American comic right yes, now. It so really good. is. I, I can't think of it. Now. I mean, there's sure there's some that I haven't read. I haven't read everything, guys. But just like. I can't read anything Marvel DC right now. It's painful to even try anymore. And that's what got me to, you know, try out a bunch of manga. So I'm thankful for that part. Yeah, that's not a bad saga? It's not a bad outcome. Have you done Vinland Saga before? So I've watched the season of Vinland Saga that is out, which I believe is the first four volumes of the manga. Okay. So I yeah. am going to probably just pick it up at volume five. I don't I don't know. I'm I may go back and read one through four because sometimes there are pieces that they don't adapt, but the anime was fantastic. The animation it looked cool. I just watched a trailer for the Amazon one. I was like, holy hell, that looks awesome. I can't wait. It is that. awesome. Oh, it is yeah. truly so another that is another anime, maybe that you there is one character who's kind of a little bit more stereotypical anime, but it's the type of character that I really like, which is like this complete fucking bruiser who just like doesn't give a shit. It's like very enthusiastic what about the kids everything. call an edge lord. Yeah. <laughs> I like no, a dude not, bro sometimes. Yeah. I mean, hell, I like Jason Momoa. Give me some dude bro sometimes. You know, sometimes <laughs> you need that. Yes, this would be a very Jason Momoa type character. So mm -hmm. if you, uh, once you get there in the manga, you'll know who he is. But it, the action sequences are phenomenal. It is an excellent anime, but I'm, I'm looking forward. I really like the story too. And I watched it at the same time as I was reading the Warlord Chronicles. And they're basically like... Yeah. One's a sequel to the That's other. What everybody told <laughs> me like, like, how how much I like Vikings, how much I love Last, Last Kingdom. Everyone was like, "You got to read Vinland. That it would be right yeah. in your sweet spot." So uh, I'm looking forward to doing that. I wanted to finish uh, Berserk first, but you know, obviously, there's not an ending for Berserk. So I'm still debating if I'm going to read that final, uh, incomplete arc yet. I haven't decided okay. on that. I'm going to start Berserk in January, I think. So I'm looking forward to that. I, mean, I Golden Age is definitely one of the best things I've ever read. And I know that it, everybody says that and you get to the point where like, eh, there's no way it could be that good. And it, it really is. It really is. <laughs> That's that one thing Andrew will read with me. He'll read Berserk when I read it. So nice. Nice. we'll be able to discuss that. It's very violent. Yeah. <laughs> very violent. So I hope you're ready for that. I don't mind the violence. I don't like the thing that I don't like about Grimdark is not anything to do with the violence. I I don't like it when I feel like I can't attach myself to anyone because they're just all fair game. They're all dead. They're all going to, you know, go out the window. So I do, I do have a, a bit of trouble with that level of like nihilism where I'm just like, it's no, I'm like, I like Grimdark. I don't like nihilism. That's why I was like, I don't consider the Mark Lawrence, the broken empire trilogy grimdark it's just nihilism because like none of those characters have any redeeming qualities whatsoever mm. they're not morally gray they're mm -hmm. just morally morally black they're every <laughs> one of them both sides and it's like i don't care about any of these characters they're rapists then i just don't care you know so uh yeah it, there, there's definitely a line that gets crossed there and that's why i said i can't wait to read tad williams because it's like i need some sunshine guys reading malazan and, and god blind at the same time two of the darkest series i've ever read i'm like 
I need some sunshine in my life, I think, because I'm in a bad spot. Yeah. I just feel like I'm running in mud. But Anna Stevens has been a hit. That's her name, right? Anna Stevens? Yeah. No, it's very good. It's very good. Uh, it deals a lot more with uh, with like my gods meddling with, with with humans and stuff more than I was expecting getting into it. But I, I think if there's a if there's like a line between John Gwynn and Joe Abercrombie, she's like right there in between those two. Where it's a, it's not quite grimdark because there are very clear cut good guys in it. Uh, but uh, it's definitely that that kind of world. And yeah, I feel like any character can die at any page at this point. So I've got about fifty pages left. Not fifty pages, about hundred fifty pages left in the last book right now. But that's the that's the last book I got on deck for the year before uh, before Ted Williams. So before you started out, yeah. your brother will be proud. He'll be happy to see. Hopefully, that you're you know everybody's like, "You're gonna get your brother to come on show." Like, I've asked. He's like, "No, I am not going on camera." Hard pass. <laughs> yeah, he said hard, hard pass. He's he's not quite like me with the camera guys. He does not like to talk on there. Besides, it would just be. I mean, I, maybe you guys would like this, but it would just be uh, you know a video of him insulting me the whole time. So you know, I'm not heartbroken. Well, like said, that. No. That will get you. That's what you need, really. <laughs> Someone insult me the whole time. Read the comments in any of my Will of Time videos, guys. You'll see all those insults in there. But, you know, basically don't know nothing. I don't know what two plus two is, you know, in those comments. So that's oh, about dear. it. But uh, yeah, so I don't got anything else really planned this week. Uh, I'm sorry, you got to go back to work. I know, me too. <laughs> this is to be to be fair this is the toughest time of year because it's the toughest time of year for a lot of people so i'm expecting a heavy like the next month is going to be a heavy work month so i have tried not to load myself down with things to read because i'm sure that like some nights i'm on call for the hospital and i don't go in at all i have a feeling over the next couple of weeks i will be there would you say this is the most depressing time of the year for some yeah, for people and and it's Christmas Day doesn't end up being the worst. Like being on call on Christmas Day is usually pretty good actually. People don't tend to come into the hospital. It's after Christmas and especially after New Year. So January 2nd to 4th tends to be really bad because people feel like they need to maintain this facade over the holidays or they drink a lot over the holidays and then by the time that all wears off, it's January 2nd and that is, is a really hard time for people. So it will be, it'll be busy at work for sure. You know, not that we deal in the same kind of thing here, but it sounds like tax season for me. You know, <laughs> finance. So yeah, I get those, those, those times are, are very, very tough. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. Sorry about the time mix up. Uh, I, I, for some reason, I thought we were like a half hour off, not two and a half hours off. <laughs> You guys are weird with your half hour time zones anyway. So, you know, I assumed you had taken a nap. I was like, I think Mike just fell asleep. I know he's not feeling well. So. No, I was like, oh, I didn't respond to her. I should tell her that time is going to work for me. Like, oh shit, wait a second. It's probably already past that time, isn't it? So uh, please tell your, 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 your husband, I'm sorry about that. That was my fault. I'm, yeah. I'm usually way more reliable than that. But uh, uh, anybody not know where to find you? Why don't you tell them where they can find you? Definitely. So the channel is Sarah Reads. I'm Mike will probably link it unless I, you know, know, made this conversation too unbearable. And then I also am on Instagram. That's Darth Ops is my Instagram handle. And I do have Discord now. It's very small. So if you're nervous, this was my thing. Like, despite the fact that your Discord is a very welcoming space, I find it hard to yeah. like jump into the middle because there's so many friendships that are already established and people know each other really well and they know the in jokes and the, you know, which emojis mean what, what gifs <laughs> people are going to put up there. So if you are looking for like a, a more intimate gathering, then you you can feel free to come over. I swear a lot more on Discord than I do on my YouTube channel. People, people commented on last year. They're like, "Wow, you swore." I was like, "If you only knew in real life." <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I don't swear a ton on the channel. I was like, "You guys could hear me in real life. You'd be a gas." Because someone, someone basically that was a patron like bounced because I used bad language in my Jay Kristoff review, and I'm like, "Man, you have no idea, do you?" So yeah, I, I think I do a, a good job of, of keeping that. Yes, kind of keep it, in not everybody's comfortable, right? I'm I I do wish to be a welcoming place for people, and I will usually like I'll usually spoiler bar. So I'll be like, guys, there's some heavy language coming up. If yeah. you don't like to read that, then here you go. Well, I hope you guys will check out her channel. I think it's a very comforting place, very very welcoming place, and and like myself, well, like I used to be, uh, she's very engaging in her comments. So make sure you you, you leave her a comment. She'll probably almost always come back and tell you, Hey, I haven't read that yet. Or I haven't watched that yet. Uh, but I will, you know, so she's always open to these things, I think. Cause, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I was actually expecting to be like, no, I haven't read red rising yet. So you actually got one up on me on that one. So how about that? So you learn something new 
all the, the time. YouTube fan coming in asking me if I've read it. Yeah, right. It's, it's, <laughs> that's that's how I feel. Like all these new first law fans, like calm down, calm down. Or you know, that's how I actually when I felt when Game of Thrones got big on TV and people were like, oh, well, you should read the books. I'm like, oh my god, uh-huh. yeah, that was hard for me. I was never the you know book elitist. Like, oh, well, I can. I won't lie. I enjoyed watching everybody's meltdowns that hadn't read it. Every time there was a character death, I enjoyed that. But I don't feel like I was ever like, oh, well, you don't ever understand because I'm a book fan. But uh, but yeah, when people would be like, oh, well, you should read the books. <laughs> oh, child, child. Yeah. So. Sweet summer child. I have a hard time. So I, I've talked to Patrick about this. I love it when people come in and love the things that I love. I have a harder time when I feel like certain things do really well in the YouTube algorithm. So you then make your content about that when maybe it's not what you really love. Yeah. And there are people who have loved it for a long time. And you're like, <laughs> so then, yeah, that, like I try is... to tell people, if, if, if I was doing this for clicks, guys, I, I you just talk about Sanderson and Wheel of Time, like constantly. <laughs> But I was like, I don't do this for clicks. This is stuff I want to talk about, you know? So, uh, but yeah, that's, it's, that's tough. That's tough, you know, to, to try to balance what you want and what you want to make sure your audience wants. It's tough. Yeah, but it's nice. It's good. I, I love BookTube. It's great to have more people. Every time someone tells me that they're going to read The Dark Tower, I'm like, so happy right now. Yeah, you have made my day. But, well, well, it's like, well, get to the end of The Dark Tower and then we'll talk. <laughs> oh, 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 so. I'm looking forward to seeing what Philip thinks uh, when he gets yes, to the end of it because he's really enjoying it so far. So I'm excited about that. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks for joining me. I do appreciate it on the Christmas holiday and all that, and especially since it's your last day off, uh, spend this much time with me. I do appreciate it. But uh, no problem. You'll be my kids' favorite person now. They have had two and a half hours of video game time, so they are Mike's going to be their new favorite person. It's good for it. it builds hand eye coordination. That's why that's true. My parents <laughs> way back in the day. All right. Well, have a great rest of the year and a happy new year and all that stuff. And uh, try to enjoy work as much as possible. Yes. Thank you so much. No problem. See ya.